affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. A sealed book. Presents Suspense. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'm sure you will agree that almost every religion holds that the soul is immortal and recognizes a life after death. However, we're going to be telling you about people who believe in reincarnation, and uh, they have a somewhat different approach to immortality. Those who believe in reincarnation are convinced that your soul lives on in another person's body in a later life. Some men and women even claim they remember bits and pieces of their former lives. I see... I see a gallows. It's a hanging. I can hear the creak of the gibbet and the, and the rattle of chains. I hear them plainly. There are people watching. People dressed strangely. Dressed in clothing of a different century. Some of them are eating and drinking. They're enjoying watching a man hang. A man like me. Me. David Matson, who lives today. I see them. And they're hanging. And I know I was there. I was there. mystery drama, Terror on the Heath, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Shepard Strudwick. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Are you a browser? I mean a browser in a bookstore. If you are, you will readily acknowledge that bookstores are sectioned off with books in various classifications. One of the largest sections has become the how-to books. On those shelves, the reader can find a book that will tell him how to do almost anything, from painting or sewing to making a harpsichord. Everything that is except a book telling a man how to explain to his wife that he's leaving her. David, darling, I didn't know this was serious. Very serious. But whatever it is, we'll weather it. We've had quite a few ups and downs in ten years of marriage. 
We'll handle it together. That's just it. This is... This is something that you will have to handle alone. I don't understand. Look, Jan, I, I, I don't know any other way of saying this. I'm going to leave you. You mean that, don't you? Yes, I'm sorry. All right, David. Why? I can't tell you. You can't tell me. David, look at me. I'm the woman you love. At least I think you love me for ten years. You're not going to... I still love you, Jan, I swear. Then why are you leaving? Because... Because I have to. Have to? You won't have a thing to worry about. I'll take care of you and the children just as if I were living here. I just don't believe this whole scene. It's like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Or Edgar Allan Poe. What? I think 2500 a month should cover everything. But if you need what more... What do you mean about Edgar Allan Poe? Nothing. Is 2500 going to be... We're using words as a smokescreen to hide the truth. We've never done that. I guess there's no way a man can ever tell a woman he's leaving. All I want is the reason why you're leaving. That's just what I can't tell you. What are you going to tell the children? <laughs> Isn't that your job? You're the one who's leaving. Oh, David, this isn't like you. What's happened? I wish it was something simple and, and less cruel, like being able to say... Jen... I've fallen in love and I want a divorce, but it isn't like that at all. Then what is it like? A horror story. No, no, no secretary's going to tell me that Dave Matson's not into me. He'll see me and he's it's going to... It's all right, Miss Manners. I'll see Miss Anderson. Come in, Lon. Well, thanks. Now, what's this business about your leaving Jan all about? I suppose this couldn't be avoided. Why would you want to avoid me, your best friend? What is all this stuff about horror stories and Edgar Allan Poe? Oh, it's just a figure of speech. Oh, sure. Just enough to make you walk away from what I know was a good marriage. Thanks, Lon. And you're going to tell me why you're doing it. But only... Only if you give me your solemn promise that you won't tell Jan or Cecily. But that's exactly... I know. I know. That's exactly why you came. To find out and try to help. To tell Jan... But that's the one thing you can't do. Okay. You have my word. I'd like you to look at these photostatic copies of English newspapers of the 1850s. Are you kidding? Read them. <sighs> Hampstead Heath, terror strikes again, vicious killer claims a victim. Nine-year-old girl stabbed to death. Look, David, I don't see what these... Go on. Could... Well, but these are just more of the same. Police baffled by Heath Knifings, Inspector Gregory of Scotland Yard, brand slasher, a sadist. Mm. That's enough to give you the general idea. Yes, it's also enough to confuse me thoroughly. What the devil? The devil, that's a good word. Ever hear of reincarnation, Lon? Oh, no, now wait a minute. You're not going to try to make me believe that you... Are the 20th century reincarnation of this madman. And that should make it obvious why I must leave Jan and cannot tell her why. And you believe this on the basis of these newspaper clippings? Not quite, Lon. There's more, much more. It was incredible to me at first. When was first? About six months ago. Mm. I read a book by Robert Ripple, a book that was a factual account of the lives of three notorious criminals of the 19th century. I was impressed by the writing and by the author, an assistant curator of the 19th century wing of the Museum of English History. There was one criminal in particular that fascinated me. I somehow felt I knew him. This Hampstead Heath knifer? Right. And that was when I had the first dream. Dream? Yes. I had a few drinks with Bob Ripple before coming home, and we talked about some changes. And I dreamed I saw Hampstead Heath quite clearly. It's really a forest, you know. And then along a walk outside the forest, I saw a woman's figure. I ran after her, and she turned to face me with her hands outstretched, not to welcome me, Lon, to ward me off. And when I saw her face, it was streaming blood, blood from knife slashes, and then, and then, and then I woke up. All right, all right, so you had a nightmare. That doesn't prove... That was only the first. They began to come more and more frequently, and in greater and more monstrous detail... 
with women and young girls and and blood and... I don't want to open it up. Well, uh, all right, all right. I'll grant you it's pretty rough, David, but still... Okay, come on around behind my desk. What do you see in the drawer? Uh... A knife. Not just any knife, Lon. That's a switchblade with a spring. Lethal and illegal. Okay, when did you get it and why? I don't remember buying it and I have no idea of how it got there. But I distinctly remember the first time I saw it there. It was a day after I had my face slapped by a girl I'd never seen in my life and been called a murderer. What? I was coming back from a lunch with Bob Ripple, the author of the book that opened the floodgates. A rather attractive girl in her early 20s approached us. I don't know exactly how it happened. But suddenly we found ourselves face to face and started to indulge in that ridiculous waltz of both stepping the same way to get out of each other's way. Oh, I know, I know. Suddenly she looked full at me and hissed, Murderer! And fainted right there on the sidewalk. Well, she... She was sick. That was what Bob Ripple kept telling me as he hustled me away. But why... Why would she call me a murderer? Well, I don't know. She's the one with problems. There's nothing wrong with you. Lon, do you think it's possible that that maybe this girl was... was the reincarnation of one of this killer's victims and she recognized me as this killer? Oh, no, I don't think it's possible, but obviously you do. It was the next day that I saw the knife in my desk. Look, Dave, look, you're in a state. How would you like to see a face, Lon, my face? My face on the picture of a 19th century killer. What? Come with me and I'll show it to you. Lon, this is Robert Ripple, assistant curator of the 19th century wing of this museum. Ah, nice meeting you. Pleasure. Bob, on our way to the room with the photographic exhibits, would you fill Lon in? Glad to. This particular exhibit started because of my interest in the three notorious criminals of the era. Naturally, I collected all the newspaper clippings, stories, drawings, and photographs I could find and placed them in the room along with other items that I germane to the collection. Now here, I exhibited the daguerreotypes of some of the fabulous characters of the period, along with the criminals. And here, Lon, take a look at this daguerreotype and tell me what you think. Uh, let me see. Well, good-looking guy, nice face. And if you want me to say he looks like you, I'll say it. There's a great resemblance. All right, who is he? You tell him, Bob. That man is Charles Mason, otherwise known as the Terror of Hampstead Heath, a killer who was hanged at Tyburn. December 9th, 1841. I can remember. I can almost hear... David. Let him go back. Let him remember. You can hurt him if you try to bring him back now. I can hear the wind and the creak of the gibbet and the chains and the people the people shading their eyes against the cold sun looking up to see what kind of monster was suspended in air paying with his life the slashed and bleeding bodies of the women he had mutilated good lord have you seen him like this before only once so what do we do nothing if it follows the pattern of the other time he'll come out of it soon He's coming around. I'm... I'm sorry. I guess I made a fool of myself. You couldn't help it, Dave. Well, Lon, what do you think? Well, I, uh... Uh, self-hypnosis. What? Self-hypnosis. You read Ripple's book. It impressed you. You you became involved in the several hours you were here. You saw that daguerreotype that resembles you. And now you've hypnotized yourself into believing that you're a reincarnation of a murderous madman. I don't blame you for not wanting to believe I'm the reincarnation of a killer like Charles Mason. Look, what just happened was frightening, but not necessarily any proof that you're right. Uh, uh, Mr. Ripple, did you write about the hanging of Charles Mason? Oh, certainly. And there was nothing Dave said that he couldn't have gotten from reading your book, huh? Yes, that's right. Or some of the other books I showed him. There have been many graphic descriptions of the hangings at Tyburn. Ah, well, there you are, Dave. I wish you were right. Dave. Yes? I've thought of something that might just solve your friend's problem. All right, let's hear it. One of the most horrible of Mason's crimes was the murder of a young lady named Letty Legro in 1837. Her nude corpse was found on Hampstead Heath, horribly butchered. 
Her clothes were never recovered. Well, what are you trying to say? If... If Dave could remember what clothes Letty Legro was wearing when but she was... But how can we check out whether I'm telling the truth? I can give some kind of a description, but you just said nobody ever... You'll have to trust me, Dave. I believe there might be a clue if you're willing to give it a try. Of course. Shall we go back to the gallery? No, you stay here. I'll go fetch the daguerreotype of Mason. to see because there's a storm blowing. I see the leaves blowing and the trees bending. Ah, there's something else. A figure, a woman. Oh, please, I mustn't slip a fall. He's following me. I know he's following you, dear God. Help, help me, help me. I see something glowing. A dress, yes. It's a, it's a dress, a long dress. The girl is holding it up as she... She, she's running. I have to catch it. He's gaining. He's closer. Oh, I can see the gleam of the night. The dress. What color is the dress, David? Can you see? She, she's gone now. Gone. The color of the dress. Was it white? No. Not white. It was yellow. A yellow dress with a pale matching scarf and a lace handkerchief. The handkerchief is white, but the dress is yellow. <laughs> been some fairly convincing arguments on the side of reincarnations. There are a number of reputable people who insist they can recall bits and portions of a life lived in another time. I know one young lady who vividly recalls a life as a waitress in Jamestown during colonial days, but I don't know of anyone who can recall being a murderer. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. people go to museums to view the works of art. David Matson took his best friend, Lon Henderson, to a museum to prove to Henderson that he, Matson, was really the reincarnation of a monstrous killer of the 19th century named Charles Mason. He showed Lon a daguerreotype of Mason, and Lon was impressed by the resemblance, but he demanded more positive proof. Bob, you said there might be some clue. You could learn something if I identified some clothes that a girl was wearing. I did. Did you find the clue? I'm afraid we did, Dave. Afraid? That means you believe that Dave is the reincarnation of Charles Mason? I told you the clothes that Lenny Legro wore when she was slashed to death have never been found. What I didn't tell you was that some six or seven years after her murder... A fine piece of white cambric that had obviously been a lady's handkerchief was found on the heath together with some yellow material. Some historians were convinced that the handkerchief had been Letty Legros and that the yellow material was part of a dress she'd been wearing. But no one could prove it. Until now. Until now. Until you just described the yellow dress and a white handkerchief. Hello? Mr. Robert Ripple. Speaking. Oh, this is Mrs. David Matson. You don't know me, but... Uh, the wife of the publisher? Yes, that's right. I'd like to come and see you. Uh, what about? My husband. And the reason he left me. My dear Mrs. Matson, I find this conversation most strange. You, a perfect stranger, calling me to discuss your marital problems? Why in the world would you believe that I would I be... I was a... told to call you. By whom? Lon Henderson. Well, I can't understand why Mr. Henderson referred you to me. Well, because he's our best friend, and I badgered him into distraction. He finally gave me your name as the one... He also has the information I have. But that's all I want. Tell Mr. Henderson I find his putting you on to me cowardly. Oh, Mr. Ripple, please. I'm... I have no intention, Mrs. Matson, of seeing you or discussing your husband and his actions at any time, now or in the future. I must 
thank you, Mr. Ripple, for your courtesy and showing me so much of your part of the museum. Well, not at all, Mrs. Larson. When the curator called and told me you were interested in becoming a patron of the museum, it was only natural we should try to show you the sort of things in which we spend your money. Well, and you've impressed me very much so. <laughs> if you don't think me impertinent, Mrs. Larson, how much so? Did you have any specific sum for a contribution in mind? Mm, not precisely. I, I really need more information. Now, I must return to Boston later today. So, well, I just want to thank you for making time for me in your busy schedule. Oh, pleasure. Oh, really, this picture... Uh, daguerreotype, Mrs. Larson. Well, whatever. Now, well, this man, he looks so familiar. Who is he? A notorious killer man named Charles Mason who was hanged in 1841. Now, if we could uh, move on. Just a moment. I... Oh. Now, this may seem a somewhat strange request, but I would like this daguerreotype. I beg your pardon. I'd like to purchase a... Or let me say, I would make a substantial bequest to the museum if I could have this picture. And why would you want that particular picture, Mrs. Larson? I take it no other will do? Well... Surely I don't have to explain no, if I just... No, but you do. Guard. What? Guard. What are you doing? What? Calling a guard to escort you out of the building, Mrs. Matson. What? Why are you... And I'd what? advise you not to make a fuss. Because if you so much as utter another syllable, I'll call the police and have you arrested for impersonating a donor when you had no such intention. Now get out of here. <laughs> I could help you, Mrs. Matson, but as I told you before, Mr. Anderson has been on the golf course all afternoon. But I told you to get a message to him that it was a matter of life and death. Well, we have tried, Mrs. Matson. I don't know why he hasn't called or even if he received right. a message. All right. Now, listen. Tell him I'm coming out to see him, and he should wait there for me no matter what happens. <laughs> David. I've got to find Lon. He's trying to avoid me. It's too dark now for him to be out on the golf course. Oh, ouch. Oh, there's gravel. I should have remembered to change my shoes. I think I'll walk on the grass. Who's that? Is there anyone there? I know you're behind that bush. And I'm not in the mood to play any stupid games. Go on me! I... Oh, God, good night! Oh, stop! Stop! Oh, Jan, Jan, do you realize that guy could have killed you? I don't know. I, I don't know why he came at me. But I'm very glad you got there when you did. Well, I didn't. I missed catching him. Didn't you see his face? No, no. He came up from behind me. He, he circled around the bushes. Oh, I see. Do you think you should stay in this house alone? Well, why not? It's my own home. But, Jane, you're not completely wrong. Recover... I appreciate your concern. They'd never have let me out of the emergency room at the hospital if they didn't think I was okay. Your arm is bandaged. It, it doesn't bother me at all, but you do. <laughs> me? Why did you send me to Ripple? Oh. Jan, how much do you know about reincarnation? You mean the belief that your soul lives on in someone else's body after you die? Yes, yes. Well, what's all that got to do? No, you? wait. David's involvement with Ripple's book has somehow convinced him that the soul of this 19th century killer, Charles Mason, was in his body. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yes. That's what I thought, too. Thought? Then you believe Jen, now that... please. After reading Ripple's book, Dave told me he felt strangely familiar with all the events that related to Charles Mason. He said he felt as if he'd almost lived them. He went to the museum to talk with Ripple about this strange phenomenon, and then he saw the picture. And? Well, you saw it. Can you deny that... You uh... allowed a resemblance to convince you that David was the reincarnation of a 19th century criminal? I refuse to believe it. There's more, Jan. Nothing that you can say will convince me. Reincarnation of... <sighs> Listen, people have been arguing about whether there really is such a thing as a soul for centuries. Now listen to me. David looked at that picture and went into some sort of a trance. 
He recalled actual scenes and incidents from more than 100 years ago. David is a bright man with a vast store of knowledge. His subconscious must retain his readings from hundreds of books and manuscripts. And then because of some quirk and his vivid imagination, he's able to recall it. I know, I know. I felt the way you did, and I brought up the subject of self-hypnosis. It was then that David described the clothing of one of Mason's victims. And that's one thing he couldn't have read or heard anywhere. Then you must believe that David was right to leave me. Well, he loves you. What else could he have done? Trusted that love. Trusted our years together. Trusted the strength that's made our marriage work and and told me the truth and tried to work it out together. Well, how do you go about working something like this out? If David really is a... I'm not going to consider that possibility. You have to. Why? Because of that bandage you're wearing on your arm. Bandage? What's that? Somebody a... went after you with a knife. I know, And that... why would anyone want to slash you? I don't know. We live in a violent world. No, no, t- no, no, Jan. No, this happened at the club. This was no ordinary mugging. What are you trying to say? Oh, I'm... Look... Are you sure there wasn't anything familiar about the man who attacked you? Something that might remind you You of... You are trying to make me think it was David, aren't you? You are trying to make me say it was David. You think it was David, don't you? Chan, look, please, we have to... Get out of my house! Well, please, be reasonable and... I said it out loud and I meant it. Lon. Oh, I'm so glad you came. Now, I apologize for my behavior the other night. There was no excuse. No, 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 no. I, I forgive you, Jan. I understand. But what do you want from me now? To go with me to see Jason Beckwith and tell him everything you know about this strange delusion of David's. Jason Beckwith? He's a professor of Romance Languages at the university. And he's also a highly regarded student of the occult. I shouldn't say student. He's he's an acknowledged authority. Jan, have you seen today's paper? No. Then you haven't read the story about the woman who was killed in the park last night? Lon, I promised I wouldn't lose my temper, no matter how many ridiculous now things Now, hold it. Said. It's not ridiculous. A woman was slashed to death in Hudson Park early this morning by a man with a knife. Now, that's a newspaper story. I suppose story. that you don't have a sneaking suspicion that that man with a knife might have been David. You bet I have. David is not a killer. All right, all right. Why don't you call him and ask him where he was last night? He couldn't kill anyone. Are you afraid to call him? Hello? Oh, David. Darling, how are you? Jan. Look, Jan, if you didn't get the check, I'm sorry, but I... I've really been bombed out for the last past few days. I don't know remember. Bombed out? Whether... What kind of talk is that? Look, Jan, I, I'm not the guy you knew. Don't you try to tell me who you are, David. You're talking to the girl who married you. You just don't know what you're up against. But I do. I do know. You know? I know exactly what you believe, and I also know it's a lot of nonsense. Oh, darling, I want you to come home. Lon should never have told you. He betrayed me and did you no good. I can't face you now, ever. David, David, listen. Well? He hung up on me. Mm Mm-hmm. And what about last night? He couldn't remember. He, well, I guess he must have been drinking, bombed out was the phrase he used. Mm, which amounts to admitting that he doesn't have an alibi for last night. He doesn't need an alibi. David is not a criminal. He thinks he is? Well, he's getting a lot of support from some of his best friends. Jan, please believe I fought it. You weren't at the museum. You didn't see and hear what yes, I... And you haven't lived with David for ten years. You think you can ever know David as I do? Oh, well, how can I answer that? Oh, don't try. Just come along with me and keep the appointment with Professor Beckwith. It's not unusual for a wife to believe in her husband. It's also not too startling to find that a husband doesn't believe in himself. However, it's both strange and frightening to find a wife 
that seems to be willing to reach back into the past to prove her husband's innocence. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Radio Chicago, News Radio 78 Time, 1108. The power of love against the power of death. The power of good against evil. Most of us like to believe that good will triumph. But very few of us are ever asked to put our belief to the acid test. Janice is doing just that. She refuses to believe the evidence that her husband David is the reincarnation of a 19th century killer. And she and her husband's best friend have come to an appointment with an expert on reincarnation and the occult. Remarkable. Most interesting. In fact, one of the most remarkable stories I've ever heard. Professor, you can take my word for it. I saw just what I told you. Nothing came from my imagination. My dear Henderson, do stop calling me professor and do stop being so defensive. I know you told me the truth. You don't mean you believe David is a reincarnation of that killer? My dear Mrs. Matson. Jan. My dear Jan. Before I can answer that question and before you panic... You have to understand more about the whole theory of reincarnation. That's why we're here. Now, reincarnation is part of some, but not all, oriental religions. The belief that the soul needs to be reborn. And final liberation and release from this need is the highest possible achievement. But why is there a need to be reborn? Because of impurities in the soul. Oh, or sin, Professor? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Beckwith. The final liberation of the soul, Henderson, is possible only for a human being who uh, has attained purity of thought. And if one doesn't have this purity of thought? Then a new life is generated from an old, just as a new candle is lighted from an old one. A new life, you said. That's right. Completely new and completely different? Trying, perhaps, to rid yourself of impurities? Possibly. Well, then, how do you account for the almost total recall that Dave had for the events and crimes connected with Charles Mason? One explanation would be that he remembers them. But if David were striving for a new life... I didn't say there wouldn't be traces and memories of another life. And I believe David has surfaced these memories... But that doesn't necessarily prove David Matson is the reincarnation of Charles Mason. Well, how else could Dave have known about... He could have experienced uh, the things he recalled as a spectator. Oh, no, no way, Beckwith. I was in the museum and you weren't. I saw and heard a deep emotional involvement on Dave's part. He was no spectator. Henderson, you've just put your finger on the single most significant bits of evidence in this whole strange history... In fact, it's the cornerstone of a theory I'm beginning to form. Come on, Lon. Now, look, I feel like a criminal. Now, don't be silly. But I'm setting David up. He thinks he's going to see me and wait till you see the look he gives me when you walk into his office. Come on. Where are you going? We're going in the back way. Oh. If I pass the desk, the receptionist will phone David. Oh, you know, Jan, you're really something else. I I just hope that just David... Just let me worry about David, Long. All right, Dave, I'm sorry we used the back door, but... It was Jan... my idea. Jan. Why didn't you call to tell... David, you look awful. You look so tired. You know, you could use a vacation up at the lodge. We could... Jan, how I wish I could... That it was as simple as that. I'd, I'd love to go away with you for, for a while, just the two of us. Well, we can't. What? I thought... <laughs> I mean, we've got some work to do first. Work? Yes, on your head. Now, listen. Ron, what is it? She's your wife, and she's great. And she has met with Professor Jason Beckwith, and he's agreed to work out an experiment. What kind of an experiment? Well, I think Jan had better explain it, since she's also going to be part of it. Sorry, Jan. It sounds too risky. But, darling, I've told you, it's a controlled experiment. Who's controlling it? Beckwith? Yes, and Lon will be there, too. The plain truth, Jan, is that I'm afraid. Well, of course. And you're afraid to come home, and you're afraid to see me alone, and you're afraid to face the night. 
Is that the way you want to live for the rest of your life? I may have to. But don't you see? The experiment offers us a way out. I know you're not Charles Mason in any way. The way you say it, you almost make me believe it. Well, it's true. So trust me. Oh, I trust you. It's me I'm worried about. How's your arm? Oh, it's much better. You can see it's out of the sling. The police haven't found who attacked you yet. They're working on it. Now, when do you want me to arrange for this? You're badly hurt. Now, it's just a surface cut. Now, listen, David, darling. Excuse when do you... me. I'll be back in a moment. I'm, I'm not feeling... David? I'll be with you in a minute, Jan. Ron, go after him. What? Go on, hurry. David. Oh, darling, don't take... Put that gun down, Dave. Don't... Why did you grab my hand, Ron? Why didn't you let me kill myself? Because that's no answer. You asked about the alternative, and this is the one that takes care of everything. Are you sure about that? What? Who are you? This is Jason Beckwith, darling. We sent for him after... After After your stupidity. I knew exactly what I was doing, and I knew why. Then explain it to her. I don't have to explain anything. You don't find it difficult to believe that the soul of a man... Dead more than 100 years has been reborn in your body. It's been pretty well proven to me. And because you're afraid of the soul of this murderer will force you into killing your wife or some other women you decided to kill yourself. That's about it. And what happens to the immortal soul? What? I asked, what do you think will happen to that soul that didn't die on the gallows at Tyburn in 1841? What happens... When David Matson blows his brains out, what happens to that soul? I... I... don't know. Think about it. Does it go on to inhabit another body and continue killing? I wouldn't know that. Do you? No, but I'd like to try and find out if you'll help me and go along with the experiment I have in mind. want to go ahead with this, Dave? Yes. Okay. But I'm under orders to inform you that this will be the last experiment into the past conducted on these premises. And the professor's briefed you on what we hope to accomplish here tonight? No, not completely. I assume it's a continuation of your trips into the past. With some additions, Mr. Ripple. Those marbles you have in that bag? Right. Hmm. Interesting. I assume they're going to play some part in the proposed experiment. Oh, they are. As will the clothing I have in this box. Is that a knife? It is. With a sharp blade? As sharp as I could get it. And don't you think that... Uh... I believe that on the top floor of this museum, there's a long, narrow corridor which runs the length of the building? Correct. Connects two rarely used storerooms. I must warn you, it's probably very stuffy up there. Is there a window we can open? Well... Yes, yes, good, but, uh, good. Uh, with the exception of Jan, I suggest we all get up there quickly. Excellent, Mr. Ripple. Uh, the corridor, just as you described it. Uh, and now the window's been opened, and we're all gathered here, ready to start. I thought Jan was... She told me she had to be part of the experiment. She'll be along later, David. Uh, There were some things we had to keep from you. Uh, Ripple, is there any way you could light this corridor better? It's fine the way it is. Uh, I'll move down the corridor. Can you see this? Uh, something shining. The knife is quite visible to anyone with normal eyesight, Professor. Good. Now, Henderson, if you'll station yourself about halfway down the corridor and wait there... And uh, don't touch the marbles. Oh, don't worry. Never was any good at shooting marbles, Beckwith. Where do you want me, Professor? As we agreed, uh, wherever you think you'd serve the museum's interest best. (laughs) Well, I think I'll stay near you. Fine. Now, what we have is the corridor. Perfect view. And along the corridor, gleaming knife. Uh, David, you stand on my right... Mr. Ripple, that puts you on my left. Mm Mm-hmm. And we all agree the corridor is quite empty. Now, Mr. Ripple, 
May I have the daguerreotype? There you are. Thanks. Now, David, look closely at this face. The face of a man named Charles Mason. And David, as I drop the marbles one by one on the stone floor, they'll start to bounce. And bounce, bounce, bounce back through the years. Listen to them bouncing. Bouncing down the long corridor of time. And the years slide by, slide by, alive with the echoes of the past. Do you see them, David? I see them and hear them. Ah, shh, Bipold. I'm walking. Walking along near the top of the hill on the heath. And I see... I see a single horseman. He's silhouetted for a moment against the moon. He comes riding, riding, and he stops. He responds, and he hides so carefully in the bushes. Pickwick, for heaven's sake, what's happening? That's Ripple. He's under two. He thinks he's there. They stand stone still, the man and the horse. The bushes hide them. A lady. A lady. She's walking. She has a cape with a hood. I can't see her face. Jan. Jan, be careful. Pretty lace and pretty face. I know help against sharp steel. No. No, it's Ripple. He's got the knife. He's down the corridor. Jan, look out. I got him. I've got him. Oh, you're not going to touch him. The window, Dave. Watch the window. Dave, the knife. Help. Help. Hold me! Hold! Robert Ripple was pure evil. He was also Charles Mason, wasn't he? Perhaps. Perhaps he just saw an opportunity to destroy a good man when he discovered that daguerreotype and realized the man in it looked exactly like you. He simply took a nameless photo and gave it a name. And gave me the horrors. But, Professor, isn't there any chance of finding out who the man in that picture really was? I'd like to know his real name. Oh, David, David, my darling. Let's just live in the 20th century. I admit it's difficult enough, but it's our very own. Here we are in the 20th century. And I have a little parlor game for you to play. Imagine yourself as some famous character in history whom you know and admire. Okay? Now, close your eyes and think hard and imagine yourself alive back in those days. And as you think, you may see some pictures in your mind that you've never seen before. Try it. I'll be back shortly. I find this whole question of reincarnation fascinating. But there's an area that's not very well covered in the books and essays that have been written. And that is the question of animals and their souls. Do they possess souls? And indeed, do they return in some form as some other animal? Or, uh, which I don't like to believe, are those of us who sin greatly reduced to becoming animals before we can stop trying to be reborn. Our cast included Shepard Strudwick, Marion Selders, William Redfield, Alon Clark, and Chris Gampell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. They, they are talking. But they're, they're fine people, Mabel. It doesn't hurt us. Yeah, well, some of them even think your wings are fake. That you just stick them on that way. That you're really some kind of a nut. Well, let them think what they want. Everhard. Yeah, yes, dear? Sit down. Huh? Please. And I don't want you to get upset 
or excited or anything. Well, when did I ever get excited? And don't interrupt, please. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. Well, my patience is at an end, Everhard. This cannot go on in one way or another. We've got to find a way to get rid of those awful wings. We can't possibly do that. Why can't we? They're embarrassing. They're expensive. They're useless. They're making us the butt of unfunny jokes from everyone in the neighborhood. And what's more, they are get in the way, Eberhard. Eberhard Edwards, those wings must go. <laughs> G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Your mother has sadly passed away, and the responsibility of planning a funeral has landed squarely on your shoulders. Sorry. So who do you send the funeral announcements to? Family, of course. Close friends, maybe people who were co-workers with your mom, some of her high school friends perhaps, the Grim Reaper, church family – whoa, 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 wait a minute, go back – the the Grim Reaper? Somebody actually requested that for their own funeral. And that's the subject of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps it would calm you a little if I were to read to you from the secret journal of Professor Drake. It's a fascinating tale. I call it Journey into the Unknown. <laughs> There are some extremely interesting entries in Professor Drake's journal, particularly those beginning with the entry made October 1st, which reads, Today my son Paul has reached the final stages in the preparation of his serum number 17. After two years of intensive work and 16 failures, he believes that he's at last succeeded. But just think of it, Paul. Before you took the serum, you could only lift 200 pounds. But now you can lift 400. Why, your strength has been doubled. Yes. With the added strength my serum will give him, man will be able to resist diseases that he succumbs to now. His lifespan will be lengthened by 20 or 30 years. Perhaps he... No, I'll answer it, Paul. Oh, it's you, Julia. Yes, I want you to do it. Oh, you can, Julia. He's right in the midst of an experiment. But I haven't seen a hurt on him in two weeks. After all, I am his fiancé. But, Julia, he can't be disturbed. He's in the... Oh, hello, darling. Why, Julia. Oh, how are you? You squeeze me so tightly. I'm... I'm sorry, dear. I'm afraid I don't know my own strength. Oh, that's all right. Now, what kind of experiment is it you're working on? Darling, I can't reveal anything yet. Not even to you. But when my work is done, you'll be the first one to hear about it. <laughs> Here's the entry for October 7th. Theorem number 17 is effective beyond Paul's wildest hopes. Oh, think of it, Paul. Today you were able to lick up 
Six hundred pounds with ease. Yeah. Why? Why are you staring at yourself in the mirror so? Father, do you notice any change in the shape of my head? Why? No, Paul. And I'd certainly notice a change if there were one. Yes, of course. It must be just my imagination. On October 8th, he wrote, This morning when I entered the laboratory, I found Paul fast asleep at his desk. I woke him. Paul, wake up. Huh? You should have gone to bed when I... <gasps> Paul. No, it can't be. What is it, Father? What's wrong? Your face. My face. Quick, hand me that mirror. Here. Here. No. No. I was right. Look at me, Father. My face has become broad. The features flattened. The cheekbones prominent. And notice how thick the hair on my body has become. I've reverted to the Neanderthal man. The Neanderthal man? But Paul, he existed 50,000 years ago. Yes, I know. At the swift pace I'm going backwards. It may only be a week, a few days, before I revert to an ape completely. Oh, Paul, what are we going to do? There's only one way I can save myself. I must find a neutralizer that will stop the serum from changing me into an ape before it's too late. In his entry for October 10th, he wrote, Paul has been working 48 hours without rest. And so far, I has been unsuccessful in finding a neutralizer. This morning, when I entered the laboratory, I could see that he is looking more and more like an ape every day. Paul, you just can't go on this way. You've got to get some rest. I can't rest. Every minute is precious. I, I lost four hours last night. What? You lost four hours? I, I don't understand. While I was working here last night, I glanced at the clock to find it was just three o'clock. Then... The next thing I remember was finding myself in the hall. And the clock was just striking seven. I can't remember those four hours. Where I was, what I was doing. Those four hours, I lost my ability to think as a man. My mind became that of an ape. During those four hours, I... I actually was an ape. <laughs> We return to the story of the terrible danger threatening this young scientist in just a moment. Meanwhile, for a breathing spell, a word from Dr. Weird. Yes, yes, a breathing spell. Something pleasant to think upon. And what subject could be more appropriate at this fall season than hats? Now, let's return to Dr. Weird and his tale, Journey into the Unknown. The entry for October 11th in Professor Drake's journal reads as follows. The changes in Paul's appearance continue. His body is now completely covered with a heavy growth of hair, and his skin is rapidly turning to a deep brown and becoming coarse and callous. His arms have lengthened almost five inches, and he walks more and more in a stooped manner with hands almost touching the floor. There's yet. No change in voice has been noted. On October 12th, he wrote, Last night, Paul suddenly dropped the test tube and snarled at me. In that moment, he was completely an ape. The entry for October 13th reads, Last night, when I came into the laboratory, I found a window open and Paul gone. I immediately rushed out into the night to find him. A few blocks away on the university campus, I saw police gathered around the body of a girl who had just been murdered. Every bone in her body had been crushed. A few hours later, Paul returned to this house. He could recall nothing of what had happened, where he'd been. To prevent another accident from occurring, today I had steel bars placed over Paul's bedroom window. Oh, it's you, Julia. Good evening, Mr. Drake. I want to see Paul. No, I'm sorry, Julia, but Paul can't be disturbed. He's asleep in his room. You've been putting me off for days, but this time I am going to see him. Hey, Julia, come back. You can't see him now. Oh, here it is. Julia, you should... Well, he... Huh? he isn't here. 
This room's empty. He isn't here. Why were those bars put over Paul's window? It's all part of the experiment, Julia. This window over here. So that someone had been the bar to pipe escape. But no man could have been bars as strong as these. That ape. What ape, Julia? The one that the police believe crushed that poor girl to death last night. No, really, Julia. Do you think for a moment that... He was using an ape in the experiment. This room was his cage. And now he's escaped. Julia, you're wrong, I assure you. He's out looking for that ape, isn't he? And the ape's the killer. Please, Julia. I'm going to get the police. At the latest by day after tomorrow. And now, a special message from police headquarters. Twenty minutes ago, an unidentified girl was found crushed to death. It is believed she was killed by the ace that murdered Betty Ryan late last night. All residents are warned to get off the street. That... Father, I heard what that announcer said. I killed that girl tonight, didn't I? And the one last night, too. I'm a murderer. Oh, Paul, listen to me. The police are looking everywhere for you. We haven't a moment to lose. The neutralizer we were working on last night. It should be ready by now, shouldn't it? Yes. And this time, I'm certain it will work. You must take an injection before it's too late and you're about forever, money. Open up, sir. The police! Quick, Father. The neutralizer before it's too late. I have to fill this hypodermic, Paul, before I can give you the injection. All right, your man. Break the door down. Hurry, Father, hurry. I am. It's too late. The yes, there he goes, man, out the window. Paul, Paul, come back. Mike, flash a warning to every patrol car. Issue Tommy guns to all the men. The orders are, shoot to kill. All right, men, spread out. We've got the eight cornered now. Please, Chief, you've got to listen to me. If you'll only let me inject this neutralizer into him, then there won't be any need for all oh, this. don't listen to him, Chief. That ape's the killer. Yeah, we're going to put an end to that ape once and for all. Oh, no, you can't. You don't understand. It isn't an ape. It's my son, Professor Drake. Yes, yeah, son. I know an ape when I see one. Yes, I know, but it's my son changed into an ape. This neutralizer will bring him back to you normal. You crazy. Okay, Mike, let him have it. No, 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 I won't let you. I'm coming, Paul. I'm coming. Hey, come back. Come back, you hear? Here I am, Paul. Paul, it's Father. I have the neutralizer. Paul, I have the injection. Here, give me your arm. No! 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 Where am I? What's happened? Oh. It was a great pity about poor Professor Drake, wasn't it? He was so young. What am I going to do with his journal? I thought I might carry on his experiments. But I would need someone to assist me as a sort of uh, human guinea pig. So perhaps you would like to volunteer. Oh, you have to go. Too bad. Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. <laughs> No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Time. The sun.
silent herald of life and death, success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. occupied France in 1943, the French resistance carried out their tasks of sabotage, tracked and hunted by the Gestapo. A grim game of blind man's buff, plot and counterplot. Commandant. Sir, he is here at last. Send him in. Yes, right away, your dogs. I've been waiting for him. Don't you know better than to keep the Commandant or the Gestapo waiting? Hey, Hitler. Hey, Hitler, you're late. It was unavoidable here, Commandant. Your orders My were... orders were for you to get certain information for me. Have you done so? Yes, Herr Commandant. Good. You had their names? All their names? Everyone, Herr Commandant. Hey, you have done well. The Third Reich will reward you. We are generous to those who serve as well. How many names? Sixteen. Fourteen men and two women. Excellent. And they are the leaders? The leaders are the representatives of their mucky group. It does not matter whether they call themselves leaders or representatives. They are the brains behind each of the resistance group. Yes, Herr yes. Commandant. Yeah, so. We will catch the brains of sixteen of these mucky bands. Fifteen, Herr Commandant. Yes, said there were sixteen men. Two of them belong to the group here in Amiens. Jacques Duclos and his wife, Manette. But the others, Marcel Lamas is from a Paris district. So is the girl, Maxine. I am not concerned with names now. You know where each one is staying here in Amiens? Yes, Herr Commandant. I have the addresses here. Uh, give it to me. Yes. We will arrest each and every one of these cattle. No, Herr Commandant. Certainly not. The Gestapo will visit them at three o'clock in the morning. That is the best time for such business. Time when people are befuddled with sleep, you understand? Yes, Herr Commandant. The Third Reich rules these dogs by fear. And the Third Reich's instrument of fear is the Gestapo. When the Gestapo strikes, they strike with terror. Not only to those whom we take, but among their neighbors who are left, you understand? The Herr Commandant could not put it more admirably. I arrange such matters with artistry. Imagine. It is the middle of the night. They're all sound asleep. Suddenly, the knock. Oh, only the Gestapo knocks at such a time. The crash of rifle butts breaking down the door. <laughs> we do not wait for them to open. They're huddled in their night clothes. Cold, half dazed. We wreck the apartment in our search. And we leave with our victims. The Gestapo has struck. Jacques? Jacques? Hmm? Jacques, are you better? At this hour of the morning, no, I'm fast asleep. If I pinch you... Oh, very well, I was fast asleep. I'm sorry. No matter. Can you not sleep on it? No. Jacques, I am afraid. What is troubling you? That is what is so bad, I don't know. But I, I feel that something is wrong. Oh, that is not like you, my darling. Perhaps not. I think one day that this Gestapo will catch us. Oh, no, we are most careful. No, we shall not have long to wait now. For what? Soon our allies will land. Then the war will be over and we shall be free. Sometimes I cannot imagine that will ever happen. It must. That is what we work for. Our future, our children. The children we cannot have. The children we dare not have now. Oh, Jacques, how much longer must we wait? Uh, yeah, perhaps too. A little more patience, my darling. If we are still alive. Why do you say that? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. That English agent, I do not trust him. But why? They have all come to Amiens to meet him. He has come from London. Suppose... 
Suppose he is a spy. He was dropped from an aircraft. You helped bury the parachute. He could have been dropped by the Luftwaffe. But he has credentials, impeccable credentials. They can be forged? Ah, no, no, my little one, you worry too much. We are checking with London. He himself suggested it. We shall not hear from London until tomorrow. That may be too late. Mm, now you have made me worried. I wonder, is it possible? Tell me, why do you think he's a spy? I don't know. That it would be so terrible, I don't know. Perhaps it is his eyes. They are so... So cold. Mm, and perhaps it is your imagination. No, there is something. Oh, if only I could remember. You knew the password. No, could have got it from one of our people. Some of our people have been captured. A man can only stand so much in the hands of the Gestapo. Yes, that is true. If you are right, it's serious, very serious. There are key men in Amiens tonight. Ah, but I hope you are not right. We shall soon know. Jacques! He talk too much about la belle France and patriotism. The English do not talk like that. That is the journey. I'm right there, you. Manette, my darling. Manette. Goodbye, my husband. Take it down. I'm afraid we shall not see any children. <laughs> Stay a little longer, Maxine. You know I would like to stay with you always, Marcel. But this is not bad. Ah, no. I shall be glad when we are back there. It has been worthwhile to talk to this British agent. But I shall be relieved when it is tomorrow. And we can leave on your I wish you did not have to go. But I'm afraid the patrol might pick you up. I must go before it is light, darling. If I am seen leaving Ah, no, it would be dangerous. You must walk by the cafe in the morning so that I may know you are safe. Oh, yes. At nine o'clock, darling. Then I will take the train. And tomorrow night I shall see you in Paris. Maxine, my darling. No, no, no. Best that you go quickly. The next time the patrol has passed... I will look and see. Wait. I will put the light out. Now look. The patrol is just turning the corner into the street. Another five minutes, and it will be safe. Then I will put on my coat. Do you still love me as much as ever? Ah, little rabbit, how could I not love you? Then I can go with a warm heart. Is the patrol out of sight? Not yet. They wait there for me. Maxi! Who, what is it? Lois, drawing up outside. They can stop you. They can stop you? They're coming here? Yes, quickly, darling. Come through the skylight. I see the roof. No, I, I will lift you. <gasps> Goodbye, my darling. You are coming. No, they know I am here. If, if if I come, they will follow and catch us both. I am not going. You go, rabbit. You must. Without you, I do not want to leave. You must go. I could not bear to see you in the hands of the Gestapo. I should have to watch. That I could not do. <laughs> Close the skylight. Go quickly. <laughs> What do you want? We break down the door. All right, I'm coming. So, your address, right. Uh, I said, why are you dressed? I, I study at night. You're lying. Uh, answer me when I speak. I say you're lying. I study at night. Who else has been here? No one. Ah, who else has been here? I shall tell you nothing, you filthy... Ah, 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 ah. Don't kill him, you fool. Ah, we want them all alive. That's oh. <laughs> My cell, it is morning, my friend. Uh, is your wound troubling you? A little. I hoped they would kill me. You may be sure they will do that. Are, are we in Gestapo headquarters, Jacques? No. In a cell in Amiens prison. And, and the rest? In cells in this lock. Manet. Did they, did they get Manet? Yes, my little Manet. Oh, Jacques. 
Uh, what can I say? Nothing. We can only hope they will kill us quick. That would be merciful. Maxine, is she... No, I do not think so. How did she escape? She was with me. They did not know. I get her out of the skylight just before they come in. And then she's free. One out of sixteen. That British agent was the Gestapo spy. Maxine was suspicious of him all along. She will tell the others. They will try and rescue us. Rescue us? <laughs> My friend, we are in Amiens prison. If they try to break in, they will all be killed. So? But I, I think they will try. No, Simon will take over the Amiens group. He is sensible. You mean? The Gestapo would like them to try. That is why we are in Amiens prison. <laughs> Are we going to question the prisoners, Herr Commandant? Of course. They are going to tell us all the names of each of their group. They will not talk easily. Perhaps not. But they will talk in the end. They are experts, as you should know. We start today? No, no, I'm waiting uh, for the men from Paris. They will be here tomorrow. The experts? Yes. Here they are crude. Sometimes they kill men too soon. We have specially trained men in Paris who do not let a man die until they have got the information we need. Berlin will be pleased. Assuredly. As soon as we have made our capture, I sent a signal. The Fuhrer himself will be informed. Ah, pity we did not get out of uh, this uh, Maxine. Well, we will get her later, doubtless. And we have one woman. Paris gets the results quicker if there is a woman. The men do not like to see them suffer. It should be interesting. Yeah. I think we might celebrate with a little drink. Geheime Stadtpolizei. At once. At once. The commandant, he did the Führer. What? Give it to me. Commandant? Yes, mein Führer. Thank you, mein Führer. But we were going to question them. No, 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 no. I would not presume to question your orders, my Fuhrer. Of course they shall be obeyed immediately. Yes, my Fuhrer. Well. Oh. The Fuhrer orders that they are to be shot tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock precisely in the courtyard of Amiens prison. As an example to the whole of France. But if they are shot, we shall not be able to question... The Fuhrer has given his instructions. Of course, of course. We will post notices of the execution in the town. Their friends may attempt to rescue. They cannot succeed. Of course not. But let us hope they try. We will have machine guns over the prison gates. Anyone who comes within 50 yards to be shot, let them try. Let them come. They will only keep an appointment with death. <laughs> to be shot tomorrow morning at eight in the prison courtyard. Notices are posted up in the town. Orders from Hitler himself. There is nothing we can do. Nothing? Have you not a marquee group in Amio? Have you not desperate and bitter men with courage? If there were any chance, I would try. You know that, Maxine. But I cannot throw the lives away uselessly. If I have to do it myself... You would merely get yourself killed. That would not save myself. I don't care. I must do something. Come over here to the window, Maxine. Now take these binoculars. And look. At what? At that big, grim building. Strong as a castle. That is Amion Prison. You cannot see into the courtyard. The walls are 30 feet high and 3 feet thick. Anyone approaching within 50 yards tomorrow morning will be shot. We could storm the gates with hand grenades. Observe, they are 20 feet high. They are made of heavy iron. Hand grenades would scarcely dent them. Dynamite! 
We could use dynamite as we did with the tank. I tell you, we cannot get near the gates. They have mounted machine guns over them. Yes. You are right. It is hopeless. Yes. You need a bomb to get into that prison. Not hand grenades. Yes. A bomb? A large bomb. We have no large bombs. And if we had, we could not get one there. London? What do you mean? We must tell London on the radio. The RAF have bombs, and they will get them there. Yes, yes, we could ask them. But we should not be able to break into their cells. No, the RAF must bomb the gates when our men are taken into the courtyard. But they, they might be hit. It is a chance. The RAF can be very accurate. Do you not remember the Renault factory? When they bombed that, none of the houses around it were touched. True, true, but there is also a matter of time. They will not bring them into the courtyard until three minutes to eight. They may be a, a minute late. That, that makes two minutes to eight, and at eight they are dead. If the planes came in at two minutes to eight, oh, we could be waiting. I do not think they could possibly time an attack so accurately. So many things could go wrong. There would be no march. We can ask them if they will try. Yes. Yes, we could. I will tell Henri to get a message over the radio to London immediately. Here's the group lesson, boys. All right, chaps. All right, chaps. Here's the pen. Oh, shut that window, will you? Thank you. Smoke if you wish. That is, uh, carry on smoking. <laughs> Are all the crews here, squadron leader? Yes, sir. Three crews. Good. There's a bit of a flap on about this particular jaunt. It's going to be a bit tricky. The ABM is very anxious we should pull it off. I'm coming along with you. I'll be in your kite, David. Oh, good show, sir. Uh, where are we going? Come here. Here we are on this map. Oh, short trip, sir. Yes, now, have a good look at these mosaics. This is the town of Armion, and this is the prison. There are 14 men and a woman due to be shot there by the Gestapo tomorrow morning at 8. And we aim to arrive first? Is that the idea, sir? Yes. And now this is the drill. We blow the gates in here. The Marquis will have men outside. They will have to be smack on target then, sir. Very much, sir. Those who are going to be shot will be in the courtyard here. Mm. Get a bit close. I think we better have a go on the bombing range this evening, sir. Yes, I'm having some gates fixed up. I want to see them knocked down without <laughs> fail on the first run. No dummy runs. Roger, it should be fairly straightforward. There is one small item. Time of arrival. Oh, it must be before eight, of course. It's not quite as simple as that. They don't bring the men into the courtyard until three minutes to eight. Well, yes, sir. Oh, I see you've all got the idea. So we'll have just three minutes margin, sir. No margin at all. They might be a minute late coming out. If we arrive too soon, they won't fetch them out. I see what you mean, sir. And if we're a minute late, then they'll never get out. That's it. So we arrive over target at two minutes to eight precisely. Oh, I say, sir, that's asking a lot, I know. But this squadron is going to do it. Understand, everybody? We blow those gates in at exactly two minutes to eight. <laughs> Down the Here, get up. Stand in front of me. He cannot. He is delirious. Wake him up. I'm going to talk then. He is feverish, Herr Commandant. And I wake him. He is wounded. He should have attention. There is no need. He will be dead in an hour. You are going to kill us? It is now seven o'clock. You will only be shot in exactly one hour in the courtyard. My wife, she has not done anything. You cannot shoot her. She knows nothing. She will be shot with the rest of you. This wounded man, he cannot move. Then the rest of you will carry him. For the moment, you may reflect on your own stupidity and the fact that you all have one hour left to live. <laughs> This 
Mr. Buzz, there's a storm coming up, sir. Yes, as far as I can check at present, we're about 45 seconds left, then. So we'll make it up, sir. We'll have to. We'll check time over Abbeville. We should go over there at 12 minutes to 8. We're on, sir. Yeah, Philly, this isn't a trip to Paris, sir. I'd like to have a look at it again. <laughs> you stood a little popsy there, sir. Paris, the murky detail. But she was a nice popsy. A big, warm-hearted girl. Kind-hearted. If she looked twice at you. Oh, yes, that too. Maxine, something or other. Yeah, probably hooked up with some Johnny in the resistance by now, sir. Well, it's hardly likely she's pining for you, David. No. I wouldn't mind seeing her again, though. She might like to see me. Not if she's in her right mind. Look out. Messerschmitt. Sun in the sun, boys. Here they come. This is where they mean business. Nice shooting, Charlie. You've got one, I think. Yes? Yes, he's going down. Chief of George has been hit. Smoke from the starboard engine. He's turning off, keeping the fire away from the tanks. We'll have to go with him, sir. They're coming in again. Oh, the skipper, squadron leader. Here they come. The Christmas devils. Wait till you see the whites of their eyes this time, Charlie. Two, damn it. They're turning for her. Looks as though they've had enough. Chief of George seems all right. Of course, the fire ice. I'm turning back onto course. Yes, he's still tagging along with us. Trust old Tommy not to miss a party. What time is it, Simon? Oh, ten minutes to eight. There is no need for you to come with us, Maxine. I am coming. If the RAF get here in time. There is one thing that worries me. They will hear the aircraft. Oh. We often hear planes fly over. They will not know until the bombs. Then we must move quickly. We will be ready as soon as we hear them. Surely we should hear them by now, in the distance. We should. There is nothing. The sky is empty. Have you coming up, sir? Now, 7.50 and 30 seconds. We're two and a half minutes late. Yes, John Messerschmitt. I'll give a full throttle. We should just make it. We must. We've got to get there. And we'll have a bash, sir. Oops, have that tree cut down for the next time I pass. Give a full throttle. We've got to make it. Put me down, Jacques. I will walk the last bit. Can you manage, Marcel? <laughs> it is not far across the courtyard, and I shall not have to stand for long. <laughs> there, there, now, now I can lean against the wall. I will stay next to you. Manette, my darling, you stand on the other side. So. Right in front. Look. Goodbye, Manette, my darling. Goodbye, Maxine. Wherever you are. Bring a break it up! We are in the courtyard. I heard them singing the martial air. The planes are too late. Do not despair, Maxine. There is still time. No. We should hear them. There is no sound at all. It is the end, Simon. The end. One minute and forty-five seconds to eight. Oh, look! Oh, there they are! They're just clearing the rooftops. And that is why we did not hear them before. Oh, they are so big! I did not expect to... They are frightening! They're right overhead! Three Lancaster! Chaps, you bagged a lot. 
all looking very pleased down there. Nothing more for us to do. Oh, look at them. Look at them, sir. They're waving like mad. Well, come on, let's get back and have some breakfast. Oh, pity. I could have gone down and made a date for tonight. You've got a date for tonight. Berlin. <laughs> listening for another mounting drama of action and suspense when we again bring you The Eleventh Hour. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Escape. Escape tonight to occupied France and the underground. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, a new series of programs of which this, the second, is Operation Fleur de Lis, written and directed by William N. Robeson. <laughs> Today, the 14th of July, the people of a free France celebrate the anniversary of their escape from the tyranny of the kings of Versailles. 158 years ago today, the people of Paris stormed the Bastille and let loose the French Revolution. The torch of liberty set a fire that day never burned more fiercely than during the years when France was occupied by the Nazis. We escape tonight to occupied France, from which three years ago there was no escape. You can call me Duke, but don't use my right name. I might want to go back to France someday. And there are a lot of people in the world that wouldn't understand that what I did was justified in a war. No, I don't have any regrets. Moral ones, that is. It isn't what I did to Renee that keeps me awake at nights. It's just the memory of her. There isn't much about her in my official report on Operation Fleur-de-Lis. But then it isn't customary to include descriptions of 
slim, sunburned legs and wide, deep brown eyes in a military document. And anyway, she was only an incident in the operation, even if she became somewhat more important to me. Operation Florida Lee began like all the others in the grubby, undistinguished house in London, which was the headquarters of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, otherwise known in various parts of the world as screwballs, cutthroats, spies, cloak and dagger boys, and American underground agents. Gentlemen, Operation Fleur de Lis is planned to assist the advance of our forces once they've secured a beachhead in Normandy. Is that where we're going in, Major? That is one of the possibilities, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. You will jump over Grand Maw in northern France, here on the map. You have to set up roadblocks on these three state highways. Here, here, and here. Uh, there is an underground contact near Grand Maw, sir? Yes, Alcine Dutton. He's leader of the local Maquis. He's expecting him. Hmm. In addition, you are to block these railroad lines entering and leaving Grand Maw. These operations are to coincide with the advance of our ground forces. If they land in Normandy. If they land in Normandy. You will in plane tonight at 2100 hours and will drop over your objective at, oh, I should think, approximately 2230. Any questions? Uh, no, I don't think so, sir. Well, yes, sir, I have a question. Yes, Lieutenant? How many of us are going on this mission? Just the two of you. Just the two of us. And all we had to do was organize an underground army, disrupt the supply lines of a half a dozen Nazi divisions, and give support to the entire Allied invasion. Just the two of us. But that's the way the OSS worked. But nobody ordered Hill and me into it. We'd volunteered. I don't know why. Maybe for moments like this one, when you get a B-24 assigned to you as a personal taxi, and there's lots of room to sprawl around after the Bombay. How do you feel? Fine. Scared? Of course I'm scared, aren't you? Me? No. This is a walk. You forget how tough it was when we were at paratroop school at Benning. Yeah, that was real rugged. If the wind wasn't right, you might land in the Chattahoochee and get all wet. And it was always the chance that you'd sprain your ankle coming down too hard. And the sun was so bright on some of those daylight jumps. Whereas we got none of those things to worry about here. A nice pitch black night over France. No sun to blind us. No Chattahoochee River to fall into. Hey, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Skipper wants to talk to you on the intercom. Thanks. Here, use my cans. Thank you. Duke here. Lieutenant, I'm over your objective. Any signal from the ground? Yes, the one arranged. Four dots, two dashes. Green. Very well. You and Lieutenant Hill move into the Bombay catwalk. I'll open Bombay doors in 30 seconds. Roger. Good luck. Thanks. Sergeant, stand by to dump those supplies as soon as we're clear. Yes, sir. Come on, Ed. This, as someone has said, is it. So soon? Just as I was settling down to a good book. Bombay doors are opening, sir. Okay, Sergeant. All right, Ed, let's check your harness. It's a frightful mess. I just can't seem to do a thing with it. I know, but this is the last party you'll have to wear it on. Okay. How am I? Well, don't look now, but your shoot's showing. Tuck it in. Let's get out on that catwalk. <laughs> Rushing breeze! And all of France at our feet. You see the signal? That's what I'm looking for. There it is. Over to the left. You got it? Got it. Let's go! You kid. Sure you kid. It helps. But for those ten seconds while you fall free, nothing helps. You hang on to the ripcord and you count off the seconds and you try not to count too fast. Your hand on that ripcord is the only certain thing in the world as you tumble head over teacups with a wind tearing sound from your ears. And there's only one thought. Always the same thought, whether it's your first or your fiftieth jump. Will the chute open? It does. Yanking at your armpits, knocking the breath out of you, slowing you down, and you swing there like a rag doll trying to get your bearings. First, you make out the horizon. That's where the black becomes darker black, where the stars stop. And you wonder about Ed, but you can't risk calling out. And now that you're located where the stars aren't, you look for the signal light, and there it is, slightly to the left. So you tug at your shroud lines, spilling a little air to guide you toward it, and it's coming toward you awfully fast. And you hope this particular French patriot has picked out a field free of trees and church steeples. And then you try to remember all the things they taught you about hitting the ground and rolling with the wind and collapsing your chute. Because it's always like this. You always feel like you've never hit the silk before. And then you're down. And you roll just right. And you collapse your chute. And it's second nature to you after all. And then you hear footsteps running towards you. And you remember another important instruction. You whip out your automatic. And you hope your French is good enough to get you by. Qui va? Who is it? Alcine here. Fleur. Delis. Okay, Alcine, come on. At last you've arrived, Lieutenant. So it seems. You have no idea how long we've wished for this moment. Hold it. That's my partner. Come on. Hey, Ed. Ed. Over here, Duke. You okay? My empennage is slightly damaged, otherwise okay. 
This is Alcine, our contact. Alcine, Lieutenant Hill. Hello, Alcine. Lieutenant, it is a great pleasure to make your acquaintance. Mm -hmm. And on behalf of my country... Yeah, well, let's get these chutes buried and blow this place. Where's your transportation, Alcine? We haven't any. What? Where's the safe house? You might be able to stay at my aunt's. I, I don't think she'd talk. You don't think, aren't you sure? Oh, yes, I'm supremely confident that Where I... are the Germans? They're everywhere. And that is why I'm so glad you're here. Now we can fight again. With your help, we will kill many Bush. Oh, wait a minute. How many are there in your Maquis? Myself and two others. Just three of you? Oh, my aching back. But now that the Americans are here, we can do anything. Oh, why don't they get these things straight in London? How can we block roads with a three-man Maquis? Three men and an ant who perhaps will not talk. Well, let's get cracking. Duke, you're not going through with this mad venture, are you? What would you suggest? Well, as for me, I'm all for taking the next plane back to London. Another piece of bread, Lieutenant. No, thank you, ma'am. This bone chicken is delicious. How do you call it? K-ration. Supreme. We've had nothing like it since the Bosch came. Yeah, well, you get used to it. And cigarettes, Tante Marie. Cigarettes made of real tobacco. Ah, you Americans have everything. Madame. Alcine, you are kind, you are hospitable, but the comforts of K-Ration will not block roads. We need men. We must form a maquis. But we have a maquis. I Look, and my... Alcine, there are three of you and two of us. Sure, we've got guns and we've got ammunition and supply chutes somewhere out in that field where we landed. We've got arms for 50 men. But if we had those men, we still couldn't go to war against a German division. Now, you said yourself, there's at least a division garrison in Grammont. What must we do? First, we must organize a maquis. We need men. Can you get them? I can go into the village and talk to my friends. You should have done that a long time ago. Falcine, that would be most unwise. Why? Didn't you know? Falcine is a patriot. He's a deserter from the Vichy army, so he's wanted by the Gestapo. Oh, great. And there's a Gestapo headquarters in Grandma, of course. Of course. Falcine is not one to run from danger. Well, quite the contrary. I can get René to help. Who's René? Alcine's sweetheart. A lovely girl from Paris. Poor thing, she had to come down to the country because her house was bombed out. Let's leave her out of this. But, Lieutenant, she would be most happy to help. Alcine... You've got a lot to learn about guerrilla warfare. You might as well study your first lesson right now. It's short and to the point. No dames. Well, the next day, we collected the supplies, which had been dropped with us, and we set up a camp deep in the woods. Hill and I were loaded with French money, so we were able to buy food from the friendly farmers. Maybe it was the food as much as patriotism that brought us recruits. Anyway, after a week, we had nearly 30 men. Our maquis wasn't big enough for the job we had to do, but it was growing in the right direction. And then one night as I was winding up a report to London... Huh? What do they say? What do they ever say? Message acknowledged. Carry on. Well, what about new batteries for the radio? What about extra ammunition for the Buck Rogers guns? When are they going to get another drop to us? Why don't you ask them? Yeah, I know. They do the best they can, I guess. After all, we're not the only Boy Scouts in this jamboree. Mm-hmm. Hey, Duke. Yeah? There goes Alcine again, off toward the road. What the... Hey, Alcine! Yes? Come here a minute. Yes, Lieutenant. Where are you going? I was just taking a stroll. You on night guard? Not tonight. You weren't on night guard last night, were you? No, Lieutenant. Or the night before? No, sir. But you weren't in camp all night, were you? No, sir. What's the matter? Don't you like the camp? Rather sleep at your aunt's? Is it too rugged out here for you? No, sir. Then where were you? In the village. You know the orders. No one is to go into the village. Yes, Lieutenant, but I only go in at night. That makes no difference. But it does. You see, Lieutenant, I'm so in love. Oh, great. The girl from Paris? Yes. You should see her, Lieutenant. She's the most beautiful, the most charming, the Don't most... Don't you know you're endangering the whole Marquis by disobeying my orders? Oh, no, sir. There's no danger with Rene. She hates the bush. Why, why, she wants to join us. You've told her about us? Oh, yes, sir. Are you out of your mind? How do you know she's all right? I just know that's all. She's the most wonderful person in the world. She, she's a real patriot. I told you, rule number one is no dames. Yes, but Rene is different. Yeah. Well, you better marry her before you bring her around here, or you'll have to share her with the rest of these wolves. Lieutenant, do I understand you? Forget it, Elsie. It's just an American figure speech. Uh, may I tell Rene she can join us? Well, not quite yet. Later, maybe. Yes, Lieutenant. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. If you got to take it, Alcine, take it easy. I do not understand. Just another American idiom, Alcine. Good night. 
Good night, sir. Hey, Duke. Hmm? You gonna let him get away with that? Well, what are we gonna do? Slap him into the guardhouse for 30 days. Only this isn't the American army. We haven't any guardhouse. Yeah, well, it stinks from a security standpoint. I know. But if we try to keep these boys from sneaking off home every now and then, we're not gonna have any maquis. Hmm. Ah, these French. An immoral race. I don't know about that. Remember Phoenix City, Alabama? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. There wasn't anything we could do. If we'd ordered Al Sane to stay in camp, he'd have sneaked off anyway. He had that dreamy, faraway look that's baffled parents, teachers, and first lieutenants since the beginning of time. I didn't worry too much about it because our marquee was growing. And Ed Hill and I were breaking our backs pushing those French kids through an airsatz basic in three weeks. Headquarters in London didn't tell us much, but we did know from the BBC that the boys had landed at Omaha Beach, and it wouldn't be long before they'd be needing our roadblocks. And then one morning, about D plus four, I think it was, I was out in the woods running a squad through concealment drill. No, no, no. Hit the dirt. Don't wait or you're dead. When you see the signal, hit the dirt right now. Pardon me, Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, I'll see Where have you been all night as though I didn't know? Lieutenant, I've got to talk to you. Okay, I'll be through here in a half hour or so. I've got to talk to you now. Huh? All right, Elsie. Okay, boys, take five. Yeah. Come along, Elsie. What's on your mind? Lieutenant, my family's been killed. Oh, no. Yes, by the Gestapo. They set fire to the house. My mother, my father, my two sisters. They ran out, the Gestapo shot them. You're sure of this? Yes, I heard it this morning from a neighbor who saw it happen. You poor kid. When can we attack, Lieutenant? When can we stop this endless training and fight the bush? Now I want only to kill and kill and kill until I paid them back for my father, my mother, my two sisters. Yeah, I know. You'll get your chance, Elsie, but not yet. We gotta wait. We're not ready yet. I'm ready. Before I wanted to fight the bush for my country. Now I want to kill him again and again. For them. I know, but you gotta be patient. This should happen to me now. Only last night when Anais said she'd marry me, come to live here with me in the camp. I was so happy. And this morning I learned this news. When did you hear from your mother last? Not for a month since we began to work, but I've written her every week. You have? Who mailed the letters? Renee mailed them for me. She's so kind and thoughtful. She, she offered to mail letters home for the other boys, too. That oh, was nice of her. Did they take advantage of her offer? A couple of them. Who? Paul and Jean. I told them about it, and they wrote their families. And Renee mailed the letters, huh? Yeah, she's a wonderful person, Lieutenant. You're going to love her. Yeah, I think I am. She's all I've got in the world now. <laughs> Two and two make four in occupied France, just the same as anywhere else. And sometimes it's just as hard to prove. But one thing was sure. Now I wanted to meet Rene in the worst way. But I had to postpone the pleasure because early that afternoon, one of the outposts broke into camp Lieutenant, out of breath. Lieutenant. Yes, Paul? Uh, the Bosch. They're coming down the road through the forest. How many? Uh, I did not stop to count them. Several truckloads, to be sure. Pass the word to Lieutenant Hill. Ask him to bring his detail into camp on the double. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Alcine. Yes, sir? Take two men and go down by the road and see what they're up to. Yes, sir. Just reconnoiter. Don't fire at them. But this is my chance for revenge. Listen to me. Don't fire at them. That's a command. Yes, sir. They may not be after us at all. Now, get going. Immediately, Lieutenant. What's the order of the day, Duke? Plan scram? Yeah, it looks like it. All your men here? The president accounted for. All right, boys. Now gather around, will you, and get yes, this. Right, get over here. Right. There's a convoy of Germans coming down the forest road. Good. Oh, That's it. It. Now, wait a minute. We're not going to fight them. You know what our job is. Roadblocks. We got tanks, artillery, and airplanes that'll be along soon to do the killing. But we have guns. Now look, our security's been pretty good. And those Krauts may be on a routine patrol. Chances are they don't even know we're here. They do now. Listen. Yeah. Well, that doesn't. All right, you men got your weapons? Yes, sir. Good. Now well, you know the procedure. Get lost. Before you leave the forest, bury your weapons, ammunition, and equipment. Rendezvous at the home of Alcine's aunt at 2200 hours tonight. Good luck. Come on, Ed, let's scram. Well, he who doesn't fight and runs away lives to fight another day. Or something like that. Who tipped them off? I'm not sure, but I got a pretty good idea. Who's down there at the road? Al Singh, he's fighting a private war, the poor jerk. The 
basic rule of three in guerrilla warfare is surprise, kill, vanish. However, when you're surprised, the only rule is vanish, and we did. There were about 50 Germans and a half a dozen dogs to track our scent. They spent the day thrashing through the woods, firing into the underbrush and finding nothing. It was a classic withdrawal, and Hill and I were proud of our little army, with the exception of Al Seen, its self-appointed hero. When we arrived at his aunt's house that night for the rendezvous, a half a dozen of the boys were already there. Who is it? Fleur. Julie. Ah, Lieutenant, come in. Good evening, madame. Alcine is already here. I'm so proud of him. Ah, Lieutenant, I was just telling Tom Marie and the boys it was magnificent. I got two of them. I killed two bush. Your orders were not to shoot. But, Lieutenant, what would you? What happened to the other boys who were with you? Jean was wounded and captured. Antoine became frightened and ran away. That blows the marquee. They'll get the full particulars from Jean. They haven't got him already. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but... Quiet. Answer it, madame. Who is it? Le. Julie. Open it. Oh, good evening, madame. Come in, boys. Run in any trouble, boys? Well, as you see, we are here. Yeah. But not for long. Lieutenant? Yes, Paul. Paul and I wish to withdraw from the Marquis. Quit? Why? The risk is too great. You afraid? For myself, no. But after what happened to John... He was wounded and captured. We all take that risk. Yes, but last night, the Gestapo got John's family. Like they did our scenes. Oh, no. Stood them up in front of their house and shot them. Shot. Who knows who'll be next? My mother, Raoul's sister, Alcine's aunt... I wish to withdraw. I so do I. I right, now, wait a minute. I don't blame you for being worried about your families. But whose families do you think the British and American armies up in Normandy are fighting to liberate? Their own? No, yours. Now, this thing isn't as bad as it looks. There's been a leak in our security. Somebody's been putting a finger on us. So we lay low until the leak's plugged. But the Germans are everywhere. Spies, perhaps, too, are everywhere. I think I know who's responsible for these murders. I'll make a deal with you. Give me a couple of days to work it out. We'll issue you boys some money and... All you've got to do is to get lost until Saturday night and then meet me back here. If I haven't patched up our security by then, you can all quit the Marquis and become collaborators. Oh, it is not that, Lieutenant. No one wishes to collaborate. But one must think of one's family. Okay. Ed. Yeah, Duke. Give the boys a thousand francs apiece. Right. Come and get it, boy. Come on. Alcine. Yes, my Lieutenant? I'm going to have a little time on my hands for the next couple of days. Do you think you could arrange to introduce me to your girlfriend? Oh, but of course, Lieutenant. Maybe, if she's okay, like you say, we can let her sign up, huh? I am desolated with happiness, Lieutenant. One thing, none of that Lieutenant business around her until I make sure she's all right. Very well. You think my French is good enough to pass as a native? But of course, Lieutenant. All right, then, pass me off as a friend of yours. Let's see, I'll need a name. Let's call me Jacques Dufresne. Jacques Dufresne. Good, I will make the arrangements immediately. I thought you'd like an excuse to get into town tonight. The next afternoon, Alcine brought the girl out to the woods near his aunt's house. I stood behind a tree to watch and make sure they weren't being followed. She was all right. Tall, long, sunburned legs, her hair caught in a blue ribbon like a little girl's. I let them walk by, and then I stepped from behind my tree. Oh, there you are, Jacques. Hello, Alcine. René, this is my good friend Jacques Dufresne. He's from Paris, too. Jacques, this is René de Cibourg. Glad to meet you, mademoiselle. And I'm honored to meet you, monsieur. Where do you live in Paris? Near the Port du Lila. But my home is no longer there. It was bombed out. Alas, so was mine. My family remain with friends, but I've come out into the country to fight with the resistance. Jacques has much influence with the commander of our Marquis. Oh, I hope you will be able to persuade him to let me join you, monsieur. I shall do what I can. It would be a privilege and an honor to work with a patriot like you. See, Jacques, I told you René was all right. You didn't tell me the half of it. Mademoiselle, you understand that we must be cautious. There are questions I must ask of a confidential nature. Why don't we meet again? Alone. Why not? Say, tonight? I have a little car. But we, we might take a drive. Fine. But, René, you promised me I that... I can see you some other time, ma chère. Remember, France comes first. <laughs> We just drove that night. She was wearing a white ribbon in her hair and a loose white dress and no stockings. We just drove around in her little Citroën with the top down and the wind blowing her hair like a girl in a magazine ad. Then we came back about midnight and parked with the bridge. I felt like I was back in high school in Illinois. Look at those stars, Jacques. Yeah. 
so many of them. So close you can almost reach out and touch them. Yeah. I had them all once, Jack. I reached out and gathered them all in my arms once. Yeah? I want you to know all about me, Jack. I want to. Don't think it's wrong of me. But I've been in love. There's nothing wrong in being in love. He was a soldier. Most everybody is these days. A German soldier. Oh. Don't you think that love is bigger than war? Or hate or anything? Yeah, I guess so. He's dead now. That's good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm not sorry he's dead. Shuck, I'm so confused. I want to understand things. I, I want to be intelligent about things. But everything gets so mixed up. Like now. Like now? Yes. Shuck, I've never been so happy as I am tonight. Not even with a German? Not even with him. Why does it have to end? Why do those blessed stars have to go out one by one to make way for another day of war? Why can't we stop time, you and I, and gather all the stars together just for us? I don't know, baby. It's never been done before, but we can try. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow night? Same time, same place. Forever, if you say the word. Forever? Sure, why not? Who knows how long forever is in this crazy world? Why not have it together? Why not get married? Why not, my most beloved? See you tomorrow night. I'll only be half alive until then. Sherry, if you want to write to your family in Paris... Give me the letter tomorrow night, and I'll mail it for you. Oh, no, no. Mm. All right, drop that rock and grab a sock. Rise and shine, lover boy. Mm, I brought you a cup of chocolate. Figured you want breakfast in bed this morning. Oh, thanks. How'd you make out last night? Okay. Details. Let's have the details. Nothing much to report. We drove, and then we parked for a while and talked. Did she give anything away? No information. She's a funny kid. Her dialogue's as corny as a bobby socks. She knows she's pretty, so she wants to be admired for her mind. But I'm sure she's our Matahari. How come? She offered to mail a letter to my family. Oh, well, that's consistent. I asked her to marry me. What? She didn't believe me, but she pretended like she did. Oh, I don't know why she's doing what she's doing. Thrills, maybe. French juvenile delinquent. Huh? Maybe. Tonight's the night. The night you get married? No, the night we get her. The boys are meeting us here at midnight, you know. What's the plan? Well, I'll take another ride with her. And about midnight, we'll be back and parked by the bridge. Mm -hmm. You'll be there out of sight. Mm -hmm. I'll have some brandy along, and I'll slug her drink with a capture pill. When she's passed out, I'll give you the come on, and you join me. Here, baby, have another drink, huh? <laughs> I shouldn't, Jack. Brandy always makes me sleepy. Well, what of it? This is a celebration of our engagement. Oh, kiss me, Jacques. Again and again. Sure. Jacques, the stars are nearer. Nearer than they've ever been. Nearer than you think, baby. I love you, Jacques. I do love you. Kiss me again. Do it again. And again. Renee. Baby, are you asleep? 
You collaborationist pig, can you hear me? Okay, Ed. Is she out? Like a red light in an air raid. Here's her purse. Yeah. Start through it while I untangle myself, will you? Now, take a look at this. What is it? A letter from Gestapo headquarters confirming receipt of three addresses. Let me see that. Well, that one's Alcine's family and that one's Jean's. And here's a Gestapo identification card. Flash your light over there. Look at her. What a dish. Look at that kisser. And she's responsible for the death of six people whose only crime was being born French. She'd have wrecked our marquee, snafu our mission, and turned me over to the Gestapo with her lipstick still on my collar. That gorgeous hunk of double cross. Now we got the proof. Let's get on with it. Okay. I guess you'd rather I... No, this is my job. Gee, she's gorgeous. Yeah. So long, honey. Thanks. She ain't so gorgeous now. Release that handbrake. Got it. Come on, shove. Not yet. Keep that steering wheel straight. The river's deepest right at the center of the bridge. Yeah. Now, hard right on the wheel. You know something, Ed? Huh? I think she finally did gather that arm full of stars. Sure, the operation was successful. When the time came, our roadblocks tied up three German divisions while Patton rolled on to the east. But I still lie awake at night thinking I should have married that dame. Yeah, the operation was successful, but the patient died. Operation Fleur de Lis was written, directed, and produced by William N. Robeson with Jack Webb as Duke, Elliot Lewis as Hill, Peggy Weber as Renee, and Harry Bartell as Alcine. Operation Fleur de Lis was based on an incident from the files of the OSS, recorded in Sub Rosa by Stuart Alsop and Thomas Braden. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Escape is presented by CBS and its affiliated stations each week at this time. Next week, we invite you to escape with F. Scott Fitzgerald in his unforgettable story, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz. And so, good night until next week, when again it will be time to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Murder by experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world famous mystery novelist and author of the recently published bestseller, The Life of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, 
Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers. Those experts who are themselves masters of the art of murder and can hold tensity at its highest. This time, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist, Kelly Roos. From the innumerable thrillers he has read and enjoyed, Mr. Roos has chosen a story by Robert Foster. To quote Mr. Roos, the story is a fascinating study of an ambitious and corrupt man venturing into the unknown and being caught in a whirlpool of violence and death. And now we present Carl Weber in Two Coffins to Fill. The scene, Nick's Place, a popular roadhouse on the West Coast. It's early evening, and the dimly lit cocktail lounge is empty, save for the bartender and a couple in a corner booth. Roger, we can't go on like this. Why not, darling? I'm tired of meeting you at discreet places, of of seeing you only when you can get away from your wife. Just have to be patient, Eve. Patient? It's already a year. How long do you think I'll go on waiting for you? What would you have me do? Leave her. Forget about the money. We can get along. On what? Oh, no, Eve. What do you think you'll get from her? I have plans. It'll take time, but I'm very patient. Well, I'm not. I can't go on waiting, Roger. I won't. I'm sorry, Eve. Another drink? Nothing affects you, does it, Roger? War, famine, or love. You're a man with only one weakness, money. Why is it that women can never break off without creating a scene? Why, you arrogant... Oh, what a fool I've been. All right, Roger, I'll, I'll break off without creating a scene. Goodbye, Roger. I'll have another, Steve, and put a dash of bitters in it. Hello, Thornton. Your friend left in a hurry. You're quite observant, Al. I'm a student of human nature. Nick's having a game in the back tonight. Interested? A game? Poker. Yes, since my date's walked out on me, I'll play a few hands. Tell Nick I'll be there. It's amazing how one small weakness can disrupt an otherwise orderly and well-thought-out plan. My wife, Frida's first husband, left her with a manufacturing plant and holdings amounting to something like four million. That's a comfortable sum of money. And I'm a man who likes comfort, or I wouldn't have married Frida. She was 40 and tired, and no bargain special in the marriage market. But I had plans. Plans that didn't include murder. Not then. I was a patient man. Patient until a weakness occurred, and I spent the night playing cards in a back room at Nick's place. That night cost me $30,000, all on my signature. Perhaps that's why Nick's gun-happy friend Al was so insistent a couple of weeks later. I was sitting at the bar in Nick's. Thornton. Yes? You busy? That depends. Nick wants to see you in his office. Wants to see me about what? I didn't ask him. I'll tell him I'll drop back after I finish this drink. Make it now. What? I said now, Thornton. All right. All right, let's have it your way. Hello, Roger. Good evening, Nick. Sit down. Before I sit down, let's have an understanding. I don't like the idea of your man here pushing me around with a gun. A gun? I kept it covered, Nick. And we don't want any trouble, Al. Nobody's seen me. Don't mind Al, Roger. He takes his work seriously. Perhaps someone will take him seriously someday. Al's a good boy. For a price. Right, Al? That's right. I'm not interested in the merits of your bodyguard. (laughs) Sit down, Roger. You're getting red in the face. Al, mix us a drink, will you? Sure, Nick. Coming up. Roger, what about that 30 grand you owe me? I'll pay you when I get it. That's a poor bet, Roger. I've been checking on you. What do you mean, checking on me? You're a punk. 
That wife of yours has got all the dough. You haven't got a dime. My personal affairs don't concern you, Nick. I'm a right guy. I've never given a right guy a bum break yet. How about that, Al? That's right. I'm a gambler, Roger. When I lose, I pay off. When I win, I aim to collect. Now, before you start laying down the law, Nick, that happens to be an uncollectible debt. Yeah, yeah, I got a lawyer, too. When you say uncollectible, Roger, you want to figure all the angles. What angles? Well, what do you figure this guy's worth? About 30 grand. Which way? Either way. What are you talking about? What do you mean, either way? Tell him, Al. Sitting up or lying down? Now, see see here, Nick. I can see, Roger. And I want you to see me tomorrow with 30 grand. I said I'd pay you. Tomorrow. I don't know if I can get it that soon. I don't like punks like you, Roger. You're crummy. With all that dough you're tied up to, you're still crummy. Well, I'll do the best I can. When I said tomorrow, Roger, I wasn't kidding. Was I, Al? You sure wasn't, Nick. I didn't like Nick calling me crummy. Whatever I was, I wasn't Nick's kind of tramp. I was furious with myself for becoming so stupidly involved with him in that card game. And Frida, Frida had me tied down as if I were a child, making me account for every nickel. If I'd had her then, I... I could have killed her. I'd have to have a talk with Frida. When I got home, she was in the library. You're late, Roger. I stopped for a drink. Won't you have your cocktails here at home? You said you were going to the doctor's. I did go. Well, I thought you'd be late. Well, not this late. Is this going to be another session, Frida? No, no, it's not going to be another session. Roger, we're growing apart, aren't we? Oh, for heaven's sake. Now, sakes. please, Roger. You'd stop treating me like a child. Do you know what someone called me today? Do you, Frida? No. Crummy. He called me crummy because I'm... Well, because I'm tied to your apron oh, strings. Oh, now, Roger. How do you think I felt? Vice president. Uh, I signed my name to half a dozen letters, and that makes me a vice president. Oh, I'm sick of it. I'm sorry. You're sorry? Did you marry me so you could push a button and have me come running? Now, don't be absurd, Roger. Why, am I? Put yourself in my place. I have put myself in your place. Tonight, while I was waiting for you. What do you mean, Frida? Well, I thought it'd be nice if we could spend the weekend at the lodge. The mountain? Yes, Roger. Why? Oh, we could... We could talk things over. Oh, why can't we talk it over now? A weekend vacation together would be nice. No, oh, then you didn't have anything to talk over. It's only a ruse to get me up to the lodge. No, 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 it wasn't a ruse. You've been wanting to handle the advertising for the plant. I wanted to surprise you. You mean you're... You're turning the advertising over to me? Yes. I'll control the whole department, uh, everything? Everything. Why... Why, that's wonderful, darling. Uh, uh, of course it's a surprise, a charming surprise. Does it make you happy, Roger? Why, of course it does. Now I have something to, to do, or something I can sink my teeth into. Then will you go up to the lodge for the weekend? Well, uh, why don't you run up by yourself this time, Frida? You need the rest, you know, and I, uh, I have something important to tend to. I wanted you to go. Of course you did, dear. But uh, next time, Frida, uh. next time. I promise you. Frida's act was more considerate than she realized. Having access to some funds, I could pay Nick, write it off to advertising. <laughs> For a moment, I felt almost kindly toward Frida. But then, as I stared at her, long and hard, wondering if I could care for her even remotely, my thoughts were revolted. I hated her for condescending to place me in charge of the advertising department. I knew I could no longer tolerate her, standing in the way of everything I was waiting for. Not until the next day did I conceive the plan. I was ready when Nick's bodyguard, Al, came into my office. Nick sent me over. I didn't think it was a social call. I don't like jokes. You're very businesslike, aren't you, Al? I work for a living. Uh, when you work, you work hard. And when you play, you you play hard. Is that right, Al? That's right. Uh, could you use, say, uh, 5000 to uh, to play with? I don't like chiselers. Chiselers? You heard me. Oh, you think I'm trying to buy you off because of the money I owe Nick? What am I supposed to think? I see. Well, here's a check for Nick. 
What do you think now? 30 grand. How do I know this is good? You're smarter than that, Al. Okay. Okay, what's on? What's 5,000 worth to you, Al? Could be worth anything. Maybe. Maybe. Nick doesn't come in on this? No, no, no. This, this is just between us. How hard is it? Well, it may be a, a, bit, a bit difficult. For 10 grand, I might see. 10,000? Uh, is it yes or is it no? Well, I... I don't know yet, Al. I, uh, I'll give you a ring tomorrow at Nick's. I... I have to make some arrangements. <laughs> Frida? Yes, Roger? Are you still planning to go to the mountains for the weekend? No, not without you. Well, I've been thinking uh, you do need a rest, you know. Oh, I can rest just as well right here. Oh, yes, yes, I realize that, but, uh, well, I thought I might come up to the lodge with you. Oh, Roger, do you really mean it? Oh, of course, dear. Oh, I, I'm so glad you decided to go with me. Oh, there's just one, just one thing, Frida. Yes? I won't be able to come up until later Saturday evening. Oh, I don't mind driving up late. Oh, but you, you don't understand, Frida, I... Uh, I expect you to drive up early. Why, Roger? Well, you can uh, check over the repair work that needs to be done on the lot. Repair work? Yes, uh, I ran into an old friend of mine today, Frida, a carpenter, Al Graves. He's, uh, well, he's a bit down on his luck, and, uh, you know, the lodge could stand some work. Well, that's, that's perfectly all right with me, Roger, but must I go up early? Well, we don't want him hanging around, do we? Mm, no, no, of course not. Good, good, then I'll ride up with Al. Now, when we get there, we can discuss the repairs. He'll look things over, and then he'll drive on back in his own car. And you want me to go up early so I can make a list of the things to be done? Yes, yes, Frida, that's it. Uh, do you mind about the carpenter, I mean? Of course I don't mind, Roger. I'm just so happy that you want to go. Thanks for the drink, Thornton. You, uh, you haven't answered my question, Al. I'm thinking. Thinking what? Murder's quite a rap. You had your proposition. If you want to forget it. I didn't say that. Then you'll do it. When's the payoff? A thousand now. Nine thousand Saturday night. You want it done about nine o'clock? Just so it happens before I get there. And I get a ride back with you. Yes, yes. Maybe you try to pull something like the cops. Oh, I couldn't ring, risk bringing the police in. You're smart enough to know that. Smarter than you think, Thornton. All right, now, now it has to look like a struggle and a robbery. Leave that to me. Is everything okay with the wife for me to ride her up there? It will be. Saturday morning. Thornton residence? Oh, Charles, this is Mr. Thornton. Oh, good morning, sir. May I speak to Mrs. Thornton? Very well, sir. She's right here, sir. Uh, Roger? Oh, I was afraid you might have left for the lodge already. Uh, no, no, not for an hour yet. Uh, Frida, uh, I wonder if you'd mind doing something. What is it? Well, Al Graves, the carpenter who is going to drive me up... Yes? His car has broken down. It's in the garage... Would you mind terribly taking Al up with you? Oh, and Roger, really, he I... He could look over the repairs himself that way. Well, when will you come up? As soon as I'm finished working at the office, I'm, I'm working on the new advertising program. Well, I suppose I... I could have Richard take Al and myself up in the sedan. Oh, you, you don't have to bother Richard. Uh, why not take your convertible? Oh, couldn't we have that carpenter come up some other time, Roger? All right, all right. Let's just forget the whole thing, Peter, if you wish. You can go on up alone. Now, now Roger, you know that... Now, things must always go your way. Well, will you drive up in your car? Yes. Al can use it to return to town here. Well, all right. Uh, where'll I pick him up? On the corner of Hawthorne and Orange. Hawthorne and Orange. Yes, I'll tell him to watch for the convertible. All right, Roger. I I'll see you at the lodge tonight, darling. <laughs> Things for the past few days had moved so amazingly fast and remarkably well that I, I had little time to reflect upon my emotions. Frida's surprising agreement to my wishes, I knew, was merely a, a new tack in her attempt to draw me closer to her. 
And yet, as I drove through the lane to the lodge in the evening, I had an unaccountable fear. The wind whined through the trees, and the eerie sound disturbed me. I parked the car and sat for a few moments watching the lights in the lodge. It was ten o'clock. Al should have been finished long ago. I got out of the car, walked to the veranda, and opened the door. You finally got here. Yes. Well, how does it look? You satisfied? Uh, I said to make it look like a struggle. Well, don't it? I guess it's all right. Have you got the dough? Where is she? In the bedroom. Go in, take a look. Turn on the light. No, no. I, I can see. Satisfied, Thornton? She's... She's partly under the bed. Yeah, she got scared. She tried to hide. I had to follow her. Shut the door. I said to shut the door. You're a funny guy. Why? You figure all this out and can't stomach your own stuff. Let's... Let's sit down and have a drink. Huh? Sure. You got the dough? Yes, yes sure. I... Oh, there should be some glasses here. Some... On that shelf. Oh, yes, I see. I... I'll fix the drinks. When I get that drink, we're gonna blow. Where's your car? Garage. Want to see it? No. Here you are. You need it worse than I do, Thornton. Uh, well, where'll you go from here, Al? A trip, maybe. Well, you, you have nothing to worry about from me. That I know, Thornton. Uh, how was it? How was it done? Gun. Did you leave it? I'll get rid of it. Well, here's to you, Al. Yeah. All right, Thornton. Now, let's have the dough. Uh, certainly, certainly. I've, I've got it right here. You know, I've been thinking about you, Thornton. I think Nick's right. You're crummy. Oh, now, you shouldn't feel that way, Al. If I had to do it over a... You won't. Say, I, I'm sick. I mean, what'd you put in that drink? Why, nothing, Al. You, you double-crossing, I'll kill you, Al. Will you, Al? I poured some of the liquor on Al and tipped the bottle over. Then I carried him out of the lodge, across the carpet of pine needles, to the bluff a hundred yards away. I placed one of Frida's expensive bracelets in his pocket, along with some money and articles of lesser value. I dropped him over the bluff and heard his body strike the rocky stream bed 300 feet below. I went quickly to my car and drove away. I drove rapidly for an hour till I passed an all-night diner. I wheeled the car around on the highway, pointing it back in the direction I'd come. Then I ran the car into a ditch, hard. The front fender crumpled against the wheel and the tire blew out. I couldn't have wished anything better. This was it, my alibi. I walked a mile up the road to the diner. As I opened the door, a car pulled up. When I entered the cafe, a girl got out of the car and followed me in. Where'll it be, folks? Coffee, please. And you, mister? Mm. Coffee. Say, uh, is there a tow truck around? Tow truck? I blew out a tire and went into the ditch about a mile down the road. And Jim Parson has a tow truck. And him and the missus went into L.A. We'll be back till Monday. Here you are, miss. Monday. Thanks. Wreck your car bad? Uh, smashed the wheel. I don't have a spare. Oh, that's too bad. Going far? My lodge, about 50 miles up. The Thornton place. Roger Thornton. Maybe you know it. Thornton? No, can't say I do. My wife's there. But I'm sure she's all right. You don't stand much of a chance of getting a ride going that way this time of night. I suppose not. You can use a phone there, reverse the charges. No, no, the phone's disconnected up at the lodge. You might be able to hitch to L.A. Once in a while, there's a car going that way. Oh, that's an idea. Anything else for you, miss? No, thanks. How much? Ten cents. Thank you. Good night. Good night. I reckon the young lady didn't want a passenger. So it seems. 
Say, I think I will use your phone. Himself. Have you got that straight, Charles? Yes, sir. I'm to call the auto club and have them pick up your car. It's quite a way to the lodge, so I'm going to try to get a ride back to town. W- were you hurt, sir? Oh, I'm perfectly all right. It may be rather late before I get in, so leave a light in the library. Very well, sir. Good night, Charles. Is, uh, is that all, sir? Why, yes. Yes, that's all. Very well, sir. Thank you for the use of the phone. No, that's okay, mister. Could you uh, use a drink? I ain't never been known to turn one down. I got a bottle in my car. Oh, that's quite a walk. It's nice out, and I could use a drink myself. (laughs) Suit yourself. You don't mind if I sit around after I get back? Maybe I can pick up a ride. Glad to have you. I'm open all night. Good, good. I'll be right back. Mister? Yes? Did you say you wanted a ride to L.A.? Why, yes, yes, if you're going that way. Hop in. Well, thank you very much. I would have asked you in there, but I didn't want to give the counterman the wrong idea, Mr. Thornton. How did you know my name? You told the counterman. Oh. Oh, of course. I was just going to get a bottle out of my car. I already got it. You got it? Sure. Nice car, thirsty girl. I had a hunch. How long were you at the car? Long enough to find the bottle and see your name on the steering post. I thought you heard me tell the counterman. I did. So then I knew you as a gentleman. Have you... you drunk much of that bottle? Enough. Hey, you shouldn't be driving if you've been drinking too much. You're scared? Oh, no, no, it's for your own good. I'm celebrating. Oh, you might have waited till you got in Los Angeles. Mr. Thornton. Yes? Why'd you turn your car around and run it into that ditch? What? I know all about you, Mr. Thornton. Who are you? What's your name? Della. Della what? Just Della. Look out! You nearly turned us over. Either stop this car and let me drive, or... Or what, Mr. Thornton? Stop this car. When we get to Nick's. Did you... Did you say Nick's? I'm Al's girlfriend. No. Didn't you think Al could have a girlfriend? Why did you pick me up? Because I'm not half as tight as you think I am. Then, what do you want? Al was a punk, a nice punk, but punks come cheap, Mr. Thornton. I want that $9,000. Do you think I'd carry that kind of money around? And did you think Al was stupid enough not to have somebody cover him at the lodge? You you were there? You you saw? Yes, I was there, and I saw. You're a very brave girl, Della. Threatening me? I don't scare easy. I know you're kind. Do you? This is a gun, Mr. Thornton. I'm not afraid to use it. You're a very stupid child. If you try anything, I'll wreck this car. Watch that curve. I'll take that gun. Oh, let go. Now, stop that car or I'll kill you. No, you won't. I'll hold that wheel. Let go. Let go of me. Let go. We're stopping right here. All right. All right. Now, get out of the car. Get out. I'm, I'm willing to talk to you. Get out. My arm. Ow. Now, turn this ravine. I, I was only kidding you. I, I wanted to scare you. I, was, I, I didn't mean it. Must I force you? I, I won't tell nobody. You're my only witness. My only witness. Please, let me tell you. Let me talk to you. This will do. Wait. You've got to let me explain it. Wait. <laughs> When the girl told me she'd seen me kill Al, I, I went out of my head. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I shouldn't have killed her. I was stupid, but I, I couldn't help it. I couldn't stop. I, I drove the girl's car into town and left it on a side street. I dropped the gun down a sewer and caught a bus home. It was, it was almost daylight. I was tired and sick. But it was all over. It was all over. I unlocked the front door and quietly entered the house my house. I was too keyed up for sleep. What I needed was a bracer. I went into the library. Good morning, Roger. (gasps) Frida! Who did you expect? Frida, what what are you doing here? I've been waiting since you telephoned Charles. I I killed them. What? I killed them both. You? 
You killed him? <laughs> Al and the girl, and, and you're here. <laughs> you're, you're right here. Stop it. Stop it, Roger. Roger, stop it. Oh. oh I, I'm so sorry for you. I had it all figured out. I did. I had... That man, oh. Al, the carpenter, he told me everything, Rochester. I had to pay him. You paid him? You? Then it was the girl I saw. She was in the bedroom, pretending to be you, pretending to be dead. Al framed the whole thing as a shakedown. He never intended to kill you. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. You said that! You said that! Who are you to feel sorry for me? I love you. I'm going to miss you, Roger. Love! Then why did you do something? Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know. I stayed home hoping you'd come here and we could talk things over before you did anything rash. Rash? You call it rash? Do you know what I've done? That's why I'm so sorry for you. You say that once more, once more, Frida. It was greed, wasn't it, Roger? Greed for my money. I hate you, Frida. I know. And I love you. Isn't it strange, Roger? Huh. It, it's pathetic. What I wanted to tell you at the lodge, Roger. Or if I'd only told you sooner. What do you mean? Frida, what do you mean? I'll tell you. But it's too late now, Roger. You've killed two people. And you'll hang. If I let you. What are you doing with that gun? I haven't any money, Roger. I've been wiped out. That's what I wanted to tell you. You needn't have killed them. No, Frida. No. But I still love you. No, no. And I won't I... let you hang. Goodbye, Roger. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on two coffins to fill, which was chosen by guest expert Kelly Rose, whose latest mystery is Murder in Any Language. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of intrigue and surprise, of a beautiful Hollywood actress, and of a man who died twice. Selected for your approval by the famous mystery novelist Miss Helen McCloy. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. In the cast of Two Coffins to Fill, which was written by Robert Foster, were Carl Weber, Eleanor Phelps, Jimmy Stevens, Miriam Wolfe, and Maurice Tarplin. Music was under the direction of Emerson Buckley and was composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, 
on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. The program you are about to hear is fiction, science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. And now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine, John Campbell, Jr., Dreams are a remarkable thing, a remarkable power of the human mind. Freud, the psychoanalytical school, is held very important. But there's one aspect of dreaming that they deny, they overlook, perhaps. That's tonight's story. If someone handed you a photograph of a man's face... Uh, do you know who this is? Suppose that was a photograph of yourself 20 years from now. You'd have an awful hard time recognizing that. We can recognize a picture of something that we have seen. But it's impossible to recognize something that we haven't yet seen. Let's say we have a patient who comes into a analyst's office. A badly frightened man. Dr. Shock, my name is Jim Bedford. I, I got your name from the National Health Trust. They say you're the quick shock analyst they'd recommend in this area. It's nice of the Health Trust to say that. Builds up my morale in these troubled course. Of course, I speak very highly of you. I feel so darn silly running to a psychiatrist. That's for old ladies. Maybe we better forget it. I've got a lot of pressing work that I should, really should be taking let's, care of. Let's see, Mr. Bedford. Now, according to the data you gave my secretary, you were with the State War Reclaimed Bureau. Yes, that's right. I'm regional director. I've been with the Bureau all my adult life since 1971, since the Doom War. Yeah, it must be rewarding work watching the radioactive ash cleared away, houses and stores springing up again after so many decades, seeing the city itself come back from the rubble. Knowing you could take a good share of the credit. That's going to be a long task, another generation. Well, sit down and you tell me about it. No couch? I thought all you psychoanalysts had couches. <laughs> this office building was lucky to escape being hit. Yes, it's one of the few pre-war buildings left in this part of Sacramento. Matter of fact, it was your war reclaim bureau that loaned my family the money to rebuild. Doctor, why is this happening to me? What am I going to do? I, I have to stay at my job. Nobody else can do it. Nobody else knows this area the way I do. Nobody knows the people here the way I do. You were born here, Will? I've lived in Sacramento all my life. What is it that's bothering I... I have some kind of hallucination that keeps getting worse. I've tried to shake it, but it comes back bigger and stronger. Now it's getting so that I can't work. I can't do my job. I'm starting up recall-inducing equipment, Mr. Bedford. It'll put you in a state of semi-sleep for a few moments. I'd like you to tell me what this hallucination is. Then maybe I can tell you why you have it. And maybe help you do. Midnight. 
You want a beer? I'm going to have one. Size and invaluable grain ought to make beer in these times of need. Must be nice to be a big wheel and have luxuries. Your own stove, refrigerator? You know, I haven't had beer since last May. You'll survive. You've always managed to. Trade some of that black market coffee of yours or some of those eggs from your chickens. You know, we lost all our chickens. That blood disease from the old age bomb blast. Take a look at this. Your application for aid? Turned down. I know. Why? Don't ask me why. I. Oh, okay, okay. I'm the responsible person. I turned it down. You and I have been friends since we were kids. Oh, so what? You get a kick out of it, Lord, and over the people you've known. People who were something in the community before the doom war. People you had to look up to and say sir to. I'm sorry about your poultry farm. I'm sorry for all the poultry raisers, you included, and the beef raisers and the walnut growers. But certain things have to be rebuilt before others. Heavy industry comes first. Factories, steel and cement and fuel producers. Synthetic fabric. We're your people. Good night, Giller. Write me a letter on the proper form. I'll talk to you in a few days about my application for aid. Maybe you'll change your mind. Come around. Hmm. Giller ever got that farm going, he'd be the biggest black market operator in California. Five bucks a piece for great A eggs, and he knows where to get it. Everybody trying to swing a deal, make money, cash in on people's hunger. I wonder if he's really gone, or if he's hanging around outside. People like him get on my nerves. I better go see the picture. has some kind of fear of a basic insecurity, a feeling that he's faced with a problem that he must solve and can't solve. But he's got to solve it, but he can't solve it, but it must be solved. Ah, 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 Mr. Ah, I'm, I'm falling. Help me, I'm falling. No, no, you're not. You're here in my office sitting in a chair. Huh? Yes. But I was falling. I started to go out of my apartment. I opened the door to the hall, and there wasn't any floor under my feet, just emptiness. And I tried to grab hold of something, and there wasn't anything, nothing at all, anywhere. Just darkness. What happened next? Were you hurt? Doctor, how could I have been hurt? It was just in my mind. Maybe I stumbled or something, but I didn't fall, because there was no place to fall. Momentary dizziness from overwork, fatigue. Yes, yes, maybe. And since then, you've had a fear of falling. A phobia. Phobia. Phobia yes. about high places. Okay, Mr. Bedford, let's try another recall. Now, this time, I want you to remember more about the falling and your friend Giller. Oh! Stop it! Don't kill me! Don't throw me over the rail, please! Shut up! Well, you probably think I'm going to give you one last chance before we toss you off this ramp. It's not my fault. I tried to get funds, bureaus short on funds. Terrible task ahead. He can't hear you. Bedford, I came to you and begged you to okay our application, but you turned us down and you did all you could to block it. Black market rebel? Police never seemed to get you all. Probably bought off. That's right, bought off. Now look, Bedford, for old time's sake, you want to get in on this along with us. I'll let you in. I have a sentimental feeling towards you. I think you sincerely felt you shouldn't okay our application. I never will. Even if you kill me. Oh, you mean that? I've got my job. Responsibility. Heavy industry comes first. Remember when there were eggs, how the shells looked when they were dropped? Remember how it felt to crush the egg shell underfoot? How did that old nursery rhyme go about putting the pieces of the shell back together? By the way, Bedford... We're making sure the next regional director isn't so devoted to heavy industry. We're getting in somebody with, uh, shall we say, an agricultural frame of mind. Okay, let's finish this up and get going. Get him over the rail. It's almost a mile to the ground. How could a thing like this happen to me and be forgotten? Can a person forget being knocked down, kicked, and threatened with death? It wasn't forgotten. It remained buried beneath, repressed. We'll have to try some more recall, Mr. Bedford. So 
far, I don't have enough to go on. Now, this business of Giller and his men beating and terrorizing you provides what's called the traumatic incident, the moment of fear that starts the chain reaction of repression growing. But, uh, are you willing to try another recall? Not now, Doctor. You shouldn't stop at this point. I, I couldn't stand any more. Tomorrow, maybe. We'd better go on now, Mr. Bedford. Now, from what you recalled, I got an impression that there's no time to waste. I don't think they just beat you up and threatened you. I think they did throw you over the rail to your death. I think they killed you. All right, Doctor. I'll let you start your recall-inducing gadget again, but... Don't... Don't make me go back to that moment. Something else. I couldn't stand to see them standing there above me. Higher and higher, and then the ramp and the railing disappearing. At this time, I'd like you to think of something pleasant, satisfying. Perhaps a day in your work when you were particularly pleased with what you accomplished. The public baths. Kids splashing around, lots of hot water. Wonder how many of us would be dead by now, dead from contamination from the perpetual fallout if we hadn't built those huge pools and fountains over there. It's the hardest decision I ever made. I felt like a lunatic giving them the go-ahead. A lot of people were angry about that. But after I saw the figures from the anti-radiation committee, it had to be done. No matter how many people got angry, I know my duty. It's to the whole people, not a few special groups here and there. Uh, you say you okayed the building of mass public baths, and you actually stood and watched the people bathing. That's right. Togas, like ancient times. Mr. Bedford, I want you to listen to me carefully. I have something important to say to you. What's, what, what's wrong, Doctor? Well, as a licensed general practitioner, I've been interested in the idea of public baths as an anti-radiation measure. In my opinion, it's a sound idea. But the proposal hasn't yet been put through. No baths have been built. Hmm? It'll be at least five years before the baths can be put into operation. The usual interpretation doesn't quite check. Sometimes the dream isn't quite usual. If a man has a dream of the future, it's awfully hard to identify its source because the source hasn't happened yet. Tell me, Bedford, uh, you were exposed to a great deal of radiation in the early part of your life, and so were your parents. That's right. We all were. We all went through the blasts and the heavy fallout of the war, the contamination of our food, water, homes, clothing. Do you remember any unusual exposure, either to you or to your parents, radiation approaching a dangerous maximum? I, uh, let, let me try to remember. I, I'm confused. You think I'm some sort of a freak. Stop sitting there in the chair insulting yourself. You have to make plans. Plans? <laughs> There's nothing I can do. There's no way I can stop him. Try to remember any toxic dose of radiation, especially in the earliest part of your life. Now go back to the enemy missile attack. Sirens. Can you hear sirens? You're possibly running toward a shelter. Your family running, too. Across a field, maybe. I'm sorry, Doctor. I've had all I can take. I'll see you again some other time. You're leaving? Thanks for the help. I've got to consider all this. Maybe I'm not remembering the future. Maybe it's just a false memory, a neurotic fantasy. How could we check? If it's really in the future... <laughs> What's the matter? I... I can't get up. What? I can't stand up. I'm afraid I'll fall. Doctor, now I can't even get to my feet. Well, make yourself comfortable in your chair, and we'll go on with the therapy, as I said we should. I guess I have no choice. Now, you know what we're after this time. At some point in your life, you apparently were exposed to a near-toxic dose of radiation. What 
for me. Hey, don't leave me behind. Come on back. Hey, Tony, wait for me. I am. Okay. Let's get down. Get the metal lid off. And let They're almost here. Get the lid of the shelter off so we can get down there and be safe. You scared, Jimmy? Yes, yes. yes. Open that lid! Not until you apologize for what you said in class the other day. You said my family moved here because they thought nobody would bomb this sector. You said my family was scared of being bombed. Okay, let's see. Yeah.
Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. Begin with strings, add brass and woodwinds. Now the harp and percussion, for this is the theme. Play the original compositions of Frank Smith. Play them under the baton of Caesar Petrillo. For the time is five after the hour. The play, Amid the Blaze of Noon. This is a play about a soldier. It takes its title from three lines written by the poet Milton. The lines are on the subject of blindness. Oh, dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon. Irrevocably dark, total eclipse, without all hope of day. soldier is blind. Blind. Close your eyes. Now, press your hands tightly across them. Tighter. 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 Now, try to open your eyes. Try to see. This soldier is blind. He has just returned from the wars. This is the ship that has brought him back. Well, Doug, there she is. How does she look, Squirrel? Tell me how she looks. Beautiful, Doug, beautiful. An all woman. Tons and tons of pure woman. Been away all these years and she's still carrying the torch. Home sweet home. Hey, hey, there's some writing on the base. I can't make it out. I knew these binoculars were phony when I bought them in Tobruk. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. I can see it. You can what? In my mind's eye, Horatio, in my mind's eye. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse at your teeming shore. And send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Oh, very nice. Intended as a welcome mat for refugees. Well, that ain't bad for G.I. Joe's. Huddled masses yearning to be free. <laughs> That's us. Yeah. And when we get that little thumbprint on copy number 10 of that little white paper, you and I will be free. 
Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. <laughs> Hello, homeless. Hello, tempest tossed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, squirrel. As long as I've got a home, you've got a home. I know it, Doug. And as long as I've got eyes, you've got eyes. <laughs> This is a friendship born of war, born of blood and sweat and tears. Doug, the sightless one, was once a painter of pictures, and Mike, the homeless one, was once just what he is now, a lazy dreamer of dreams. And pretty soon the day came for Mike. Let's have your other thumb. Yes, sir. In the ink. That's it. Now press it here, and here, and here, and here, and here, 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 and here. This is it? This is it, Lieutenant. Uh, mister. 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 Mr. And the day came for Doug, a little later for Doug, because he had to learn things. He had to learn to walk as if he were newborn. That's it. That's it. That's fine. He learned to walk upstairs. Uh, one. Two. Three. Four. Five. And down. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. He learned to avoid the commonplace hazards of chairs and doors and curbs and overhanging boughs. He learned sight through sound and touch and smell and taste. And his fingers became his eyes. Through his fingers, he learned to read. The apple fell from the... the Three. Good. Good. He learned to type. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. He learned to sew, to weave. He learned to fix. He learned again to work the potter's wheel, to mold in clay as he had done in his student years. And he learned that he owned a sixth sense, an intuitive understanding that is denied to those of us with eyes. His step became sure. And soon he read with ease. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. And with increasing confidence, he found he could do many things he'd always done, like a melody or two on the piano. Even began to dabble a bit with brush and palette. And though he knew the work was poor, a great resolve was born within him. And he said, I'll paint again. I'll paint again. And finally, the day came for Doug. Lieutenant, I can honestly say that never in my experience as a teacher has anyone progressed so far in so short a time. Thank you, Colonel. I know you'll make good. I've never had as much confidence in anyone as I have in you. Of course, it isn't going to be easy. I know. To an artist making his mark as you were, it must be a great blow to know that you'll never paint again. But there are so many well, other pardon things... Pardon me, Colonel, but I am going to paint again. As a hobby, of course, but you... As find... a livelihood, sir. As a career. If Beethoven wrote music that he couldn't hear when he couldn't hear a note, well, I have some wonderful memories I can hope to put on canvas. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
And why not? No reason. The feeling is strong enough it will move the world. Your escort's waiting just outside. Goodbye, Lieutenant. And Godspeed. How do you like it? Not bad. Not bad at all. Homeless, this is your home. Well, it looks pretty good to me. <laughs> oh, watch out, Doug. Over to your right. There's a, a green leather wing chair, I know. Huh? And and straight ahead of us, there's a, a wood-burning fireplace. Right? Right. To the left, a, a leather sofa with a Duncan Fife coffee table in front of it. Right? Hey, who's the eyes here, you or me? <laughs> in this place, I am. Boy, I can see every nook, cranny, paint stain, and speck of dust in the place. Just as clear as if I... I know. Uh, what do you think of the skylight? Must be a 12-footer. <laughs> and the view. Oh, gorgeous. <laughs> hey, look at that water. Clear, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's turquoise at this time of day. Yeah. Uh, this is a terrific retreat, Doug. I can see why a guy would want to come here to paint. <laughs> when are you going to tell Eileen? Not until I'm sure. The minute old Mueller puts an okay on just one of my pictures, she'll get a letter. But not before. She's the reason why I want to paint, Mike. She's the reason why I've got to paint. And if Mueller says no? She'll never hear from me again. But look, Doc, here's the thing. Hold it. There's someone else in this room. Hello? Uh, Eileen. Door was open and I... Eileen. I didn't want you to... How did you know I, I was here? Mueller. Oh, Doug. Well, if you'll excuse me... No, Mike, wait. Uh, Eileen, this is Michael Gray, a uh, squirrel for short. How do you do? Uh, Mike's my... Well, my eyes for the time being. Uh, Mike, this is Miss Bartlett, my... My fiancé. Doug, it's been so long. All that time you were missing and... And then later, when we thought you were... I know. I didn't know what to do. It was months before we heard. Doug, I... I hadn't any idea you needed me so. Needed you? You didn't write that you were... That you were this way. I feel as if... Perhaps I could have... What are you trying to say? Doug, I'm married. I didn't hear you come in. Brother, I've got you the most ration, pointless dinner you've ever had. Eggs, 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 and more eggs. Tonight's we'll have them boiled, broiled, fried, and mashed, and as omelet for dessert. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what you been doing? Painting? Well, there it is on the easel. How do you like it? Well, how do I know till I turn on the light? How you can sit here and paint in the... Oh. Sorry, Doug. How do you like it? Ah. Uh... Mm-hmm. Good. That's good. You really think so, Mike? You think it even begins to compare with the old ones on the wall? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, I don't know what it is, but that probably means it's great. Doug. Yes, yeah, Squirrel? You still set on going through with it? Mm-hmm. Still. Even now that Still, I... Still, more than before. I've got to paint Squirrel or... I've got to paint.
Well, Mueller? Mm. Good, 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 good. How long has it been now? Six months. Six months. Mm hmm. Good, good. Uh, that is to say, yes, good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You wouldn't kid an old friend? Why should I do that? Uh, answering a question with a question. Bad sign. Mueller, look me in the eyes and say there's hope. You want it from the heart? I want it from the heart. There is no hope. None. Not the slightest. Thanks. I guess I knew it all the time. Play games because... So it's dark amid the blaze of noon. What? Irrevocably dark. Total eclipse. Without all hope of day. Well, where do we go from here? I told you a long time ago where we go from here. But no, suddenly you know better than Mueller. <laughs> Nobody knows better than Mueller. I've always agreed with you on that. You're you're always right. Hmm? Yeah, but even when you sent Eileen. Oh, if it was for the best, it had to be that way. For her. For you. For you. I know, I know. Well? I won't admit it's gone. My eyes, my girl, my work. What's left? I won't admit they're all gone. But they are. That is the past. What's left? You. Little boy screaming in the dark. Come out of the dark. Lead yourself. How? I told you how. Pottery. I can't. You, you can't ask me to do that. I'm an artist. Urns for sale. Help the blind. Why not apples on the street corner? Apples. The fruit of victory. Listen to me, Doug. Not pottery, heads, clay, plaster, stone, bronze, marble, who knows what. Something you can feel with your fingers. Clay. All right, clay. Look, here and here. Heads you did in clay for me when you were only starting and they were good. Why can't they still be good? Why must you be pig-headed? Why, why? Clay. God made man from a shapeless mass of clay. Not to be able to see, my boy's bad. But not to want to see. That is much worse. What are you doing? Here's your hat. Here's your cane. Come with me. Tell him what I said is true. It's true, all right. Every object in this studio was done by my students. None of them has sight. Hmm. Very interesting. And lots of them have sold. Bought good prices, too. Yes, this one's rather good. See there? You can tell just by touching it. You've had good training. You've come far. Oh, proportion's good. Uh, just ahead from memory, of course. No particular likeness. Oh, of course, it's a likeness. <laughs> Tell him, Cathy. I have no more breath. All the work is done from models. Here, give me your hand. Now place your fingers lightly on my cheek. That's right. Now trace the hollows of the eye. The nose. The lips. The chin. Don't you think you could memorize the structure, the proportion? Yes. Yes, I believe perhaps I could. Yes, yes, I believe perhaps I could. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this one? This one? Oh. 
good. Very good. More professional than the rest. Oh, yeah, much more. Thank you. Huh? I beg your pardon? You've made a compliment for the pretty teacher, Doug. That one she made herself. Oh. Well, then the old saying is wrong. The old saying? Well, I always heard it said, those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. Oh. Oh? Oh, apologies, Mueller. There are exceptions, of course. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> so the teacher is better than the class, eh? <laughs> but of course, why not? It's different for you. Not really. I'm blind, too, you know. It's good. It's good. Okay, squirrel. Isn't it, Cat? Yes, yes, it's good. <laughs> In fact, it's great. I mean, it looks like me. Doesn't it, Cat? Mm-hmm. Lear and all. All right. It looks like you and we lost a sale. Who'd be crazy enough to buy it? Oh, lots of people. My head would look swell on the top of a totem pole. What do you think it's on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Enough's enough. Well, I'm off. A uh, true confession if I ever heard one. Off to pick up Mueller. <laughs> if the jalopy will start. It's a pretty cold winter out, you know. Or wouldn't you two know? Uh uh. In here it's spring. Spring everlasting. Well, I wouldn't know about that. I've never been in love. See you geniuses in a couple of minutes. With a little surprise, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> He's right, though, Doug. The likeness is remarkable. And your work is taking on expression, too. And character. Mueller says the one of me is perfect. Because the model's perfect. Doug. You're wonderful. You're a miracle. Kathy, you've given me a whole new world. Brighter than the one I used to see when I had eyes. Having eyes and seeing aren't the same thing. People don't see just because their eyes are open. Not when their sense is shut. Yeah. Maybe I'm seeing now for the first time. When they told me that I'd never see the sun again, I I thought my life was through. I never have seen the sun. I don't miss it. Kathy, you are the sun. Very pretty. Very pretty indeed. I mean it. From my heart. Just on a chance, you're not making love to me. I am. Just on a chance. And, by the way, how is the chance? Rather good, I'd say. Kathy. Shh. Strangers within the gates. Age before beauty, as the saying goes. Oh, never mind. That was just like you. <laughs> well, geniuses, here's my surprise. Step forward, Mr. Mueller. Friend, teacher, guiding star, and fairy godfather. Mueller, he's no surprise. No. No. <laughs> the surprise is this check. Forgot his head, one hundred dollars. Yankee dollars. Doug. For a face like that, a pittance. The face? <laughs> what sold it was the eyes. The expression, as if those eyes could see. As if they can't. Thank you, Mueller. Now, my surprise. Uh, step forward, Kathy. Friend, teacher, guiding star, and wife. Why? Wife to be. Children, bless you both. <laughs> see, see the blush on Kathy's cheek. It's not a blush. No, Mueller, it's not a blush. Behold, the blaze of noon.
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company with the stores in Sugar House, Murray and Provo presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Judge's House. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. And now for tonight's story, a radio adaptation by Bob Olson of Bram Stoker's story entitled The Judge's House. Justice. Peace. How can we be certain of either when hatred burns unchecked, even beyond the grave? I am Malcolm Lane. This is my story. I want to tell it to you while there is still time. I watched them carry the parcels into the judge's house. Mrs. Widom, whom I had engaged as my housekeeper for the next three months, was directing the activity. She was an amusing little character. I had to promise that she wouldn't have to stay in the house after it began to get dark. The upholsterer's man was coming up the pathway with a cart and a new bed. Mrs. Whittam had insisted on this one new piece of furniture because, as she put it... A bed that just hasn't been aired for 50 years is not fit for young bodies to lie on. And she was right, of course. But my head was too full of plans for study to worry about such details as my living quarters. As for the tales about the harsh old judge whose house this had once been, I had only a mild enthusiasm. He must have been quite a character, though to make an entire village fear him and his house even 50 years after his death. Mrs. Whittam was positive there was something about the old place, though she nor anyone else quite knew what it was. The consensus of opinion, however, was that they would not take all the money in Drinwater's bank to spend an hour here alone. But Mrs. Whittam startled me with a very rational statement. The place is full of rats. And rats is bogies, just the same as bogies is rats. That explanation suited me very well, for as I said once before, my head was full of plans to study. Examinations were coming up soon, and I had paid three months' rent on this old house so that I would be assured of peace and quiet while I prepared for them. The only mysteries I'm interested in, Mrs. Widom, are those of harmonical progression and elliptical functions. They're mystery enough for me. Not that you won't find company here, Mr. Lane. I've already cleaned all of 50 years of dust from everything. Oh, but that waistcoat in this room must be hundreds of years old. And you'll find creaky doors aplenty and loose flats all over, ready to flap in the wind. And bureau drawers that stick and then fall down in the middle of the night. And uh, don't forget the rats. No, Mr. Lane. Don't forget the rats. The workmen were all gone, and but for the busy little figure of the housekeeper, I was alone. It was for this that I had taken the tiresome ride to Benchurch, a remote little town that had all the attractions of a desert. It was drawing close to evening as Mrs. Whittam was unpacking the last hamper, and I could see that she was beginning to cast worried glances about as the shadows began to creep into the corners of this huge dining room I'd chosen for my living quarters. Oh, you may go now, Mrs. Whittam. It's getting dark in here, and I'm sure you're anxious to get home. 
You've done well with this sole room. I shall reward you with complete possession of this house for the last two months of my tenancy. Three or four weeks will be all I'll need, and I'd hate to see that rent money go to waste. Thank you kindly, sir, but I wouldn't stay here I know, for all the money in Drinkwater's bank. (laughs) I'm really grateful, for I do want to be alone. And if you were not so opposed to it, I might be tempted to uh, accept your company. Ah, you young gentlemen, you fear nothing. And I'm certain you'll get all the solitude you need here. Uh, Good night, sir. You'll find your supper beneath the cloth. Good night, Mrs. Whittem. Oh, yes, this was comfort. After I'd finished my supper, I cleared the great oak table and got my books out. Then when I'd put fresh wood in the fire and trimmed the lamp, I sat down to a spell of hard work. I hardly looked up from my books until nearly 11 o'clock at which time I threw some more wood in the fire and indulged in one of my most deeply ingrained habits, that of tea drinking. I thoroughly enjoyed tea and drank it this night with a sense of of real enjoyment. Soon the new wood I had thrown on the fire began to crackle and the new flame threw quaint shadows about the great old room. And as I sat there sipping my tea, I reveled in the complete sense of, of isolation. Then for the first time, I noticed the noise of the rats... Strange, I hadn't heard them before. Maybe they're just getting used to me. But they're bold enough now. How busy they were. What strange noises they made. Up and down the old wainscot they went. And over the ceiling, under the floor, racing and gnawing and scratching. There were so many of them that I'd have sworn that if they set their strength to it, they could have carried the house away. I had a smile when I recalled the words of Mrs. Whittam. Rats is bogies, and bogies is rats. (laughs) The stimulation of the tea gave me a sense of security, and I grabbed the lamp to take a good look around the room. Strange why such a beautiful old place should have been so neglected for all this time. The carving on the oak panels of the wainscot was fine indeed, and that around the doors and windows was of rare merit. I saw some old pictures on the wall next to the fireplace, but they were coated so thick with dust that I couldn't distinguish any of their details, even though I did hold the lamp high above my head. Now and then I would get a quick start as the light fell upon the old walls and disclosed the glittering eyes of a rat as he would stick his face out of a hole or a crack. In an instant, it would disappear with a squeak and a scamper. Another object that struck me as odd was the rope of a great alarm bell that hung in the corner of the room on the right-hand side of the fireplace. After my inspection tour, I sat in a high-backed chair that was near the fireplace and sipped from another cup of tea. For a while, I thought the noise of the rats would drive me to distraction, but that eased off and I became accustomed to it, the same as a person gets used to the roar of water when he camps beside a stream. Soon I was so engrossed in a mathematical problem that I had forgotten everything else in the world. But since the solution to the problem came stubbornly, I looked up and was surprised to see that the fire had fallen to a dull red glow. There was a sudden quiet, the strange hush that comes in the hour before dawn. I became aware for the first time the noise of the rats had ceased. When it had happened, I couldn't remember. But something instinctive told me that it had been in the last few moments and that it had been sudden. I looked up, and what I saw... What I saw was a most amazing thing. For there on the high back chair sat an enormous rat staring at me through deadly, malignant eyes. I tried to frighten it away, but it didn't stir. I made a motion as if to throw something at it. But it only bared its teeth angrily, and its cruel eyes shone all the more bright. I'd grabbed the poker from the hearth and was going to kill the creature. But before I could reach it, that enormous rat jumped to the floor. And with a squeak that sounded like a consummate hit of the whole world, scampered up the rope of the alarm bell and disappeared in the darkness. Then, as if by a signal, the noise of the other rat started all over again. By this time, I gave up working my problem and bartered it for some much-needed sleep. It was Mrs. Whittam who woke me as she came in to make up the room. You're much paler this morning, Miss Delane. I am. You shouldn't stay up so late with your work. It isn't good for you. But tell me, how did you spend the night? I was certainly glad to see you. Alive? (laughs) Oh, yes, that was quite all right, Mrs. Whittam. The something didn't worry me too much. But the rats certainly held themselves a camp meeting. There was one that sat up in that chair by the fireplace and wouldn't go away until I chased him with a poker. It was the biggest old devil I've ever seen. Old devil. 
Maybe it was the old devil. <laughs> I only Never meant Never that... you mind, sir. Many a true word is spoken in jest. Well, pardon me, Mrs. Witham. I, I didn't mean to be rude, but the thought of the old devil himself sitting in that chair last night struck me as being rather funny. And it's a good thing you can laugh. But all the same, if I were to spend the night here tonight, oh, heaven forbid, I'd make sure I was ready for him. That night, the rats put on an earlier show, for their scamperings began almost as soon as I'd finished with my supper. The cursed creatures seemed to get on my nerves, and I sat there and puffed my pipe. While they squealed and scratched and gnawed. They seemed to grow bolder by the minute. By now they were coming to the chinks and cracks in the wall until their eyes shone like miniature lamps when the firelight struck them. They'd even make bold sallies under the floor and I'd have to frighten them away by pounding on the table with my fist. That was how I passed the early part of that night. Despite it, I became more and more engrossed in my studies. And then, a strange sensation coursed through me. For there it was again... Instinctively, I grabbed the handiest object I could find, a book, and flung it at the baleful little beast. But the book was too hastily aimed, and the huge rat didn't stir. So once again, I went into the poker routine, and once again, it fed up the rope of the alarm bell. I tried to follow its flight more closely this time, but before I could see where it went, it had been swallowed up in the shadows. And just as it had happened last night, as soon as the big rat had gone, the others resumed their activity. <laughs> I looked at my watch and found that it was very close to midnight. I built up the fire and brewed myself a pot of tea. I tried to get back to my work, but I, I suddenly became curious to know whether I had disappeared to. For I was certain that tomorrow I would most likely get myself a rat trap. I gathered all my books about me and put them in a handy position for throwing. Then I took the rope of the alarm bell and placed the end of it upon the table underneath the lamp, where there would be plenty of light on it. As I picked up the rope, I was amazed how pliable and strong it was. Ideal, I thought, for hanging a man. Soon my preparations were complete. Now, this time, my friend, I intend to learn more about you. Once again, I was hard at my work, and the noise of the rats was forgotten. But just as suddenly as before, I was aroused by that same sense of startling silence... I was conscious of a slight movement in the rope at my elbow. Without stirring, I, I checked to see if my pile of books was at easy reach. It was. I cast my glance up the rope just in time to see the huge rat drop from it to the back of the high oak chair. I grabbed a book and hurled it. With amazing agility, the rat sprang aside and dodged it. I threw a second and a third, but each time it managed to dodge my battery. It was almost funny, almost. Finally, when I was down to the last book, I took careful aim, and as I did this, the rat squeaked and seemed afraid. I let the book fly. It struck the rat with a resounding thud. It gave out a shrill, terrified shriek, and running up the back of the chair made a desperate leap, and with the speed of a bolt of lightning ran up the bell rope. The lamp rocked with a strain, but it didn't topple. Then I saw the rat leap to a molding and disappear through the hole in one of the big pictures that hung on the wall. I made a mental note of the exact spot. Third picture from the fireplace, huh? I'll remember that and have Mrs. Whittem scrub it clean the first thing tomorrow morning. I began to pick up the books I had thrown at the rat. As I did so, I took a good look at their titles. Conic sections. Mr. Rat doesn't seem to mind that. Neither did this one on cycloidal oscillations. And this one on thermodynamics, he dodged very neatly. Oh. Huh. Here's the book that got him. As I looked at the title of the book that had finally hit the huge rat, I could feel a pallor spread across my face. For the title of that book was... The Holy Bible. You are listening to The Judge's House by Bram Stoker in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy... Brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now back to the story by Bram Stoker entitled The Judge's House. Uh, 
Mr. Lane, this is Dr. Thornhill. Dr. Thornhill, are you ill, Mrs. Whittem? Your pardon, Mr. Lane, but uh, Mrs. Whittem wanted me to come up here and have a talk with you. A talk? Well, in that case, let me prepare some tea for you. Oh, please don't. Uh, that's one of the things I came to talk to you about. Mrs. Whittem thinks you drink more strong tea than is good for you. She tells me also that you put in quite long hours at your studies. Mrs. Whittem, I engaged you as a housekeeper, not as a guardian. I... Oh, please, Mr. Lane, I didn't... As a matter of fact, Lane, she didn't uh, mean to have me talk to you at all. That was my idea. I see. Well, now that you're here, what do you want me to do? Leave this house. Well, even if I could see the reason for it, I doubt if I would. But as for the tea and late hours, I might be able to give them up. Would it make you feel any better, Mrs. Whittem, if I promised not to study after uh, one o'clock tonight? Yes, if you promise. Mm, Then I promise. I advise you, not as a total stranger to your problem, Mr. Lane... I was a student once myself, you know. Of course. Shall we shake on a doctor? Uh, Fine. Now, if you will, I wish you'd uh, tell me what you've noticed in this house. Well, it's just as I've told Mrs. Whittem. I'd be working late, and I'd suddenly be... And when I looked to see which book it was that had struck the rat, the devil, as Mrs. Whittem calls it, I was amazed to find that it was the Holy Bible. (gasps) There now. Please, Mrs. Whittem, you're not hurt. Uh, Now, Mr. Lane, you say the rat always went up the rope of that alarm bell? Always. I uh, suppose you know what that rope is? No, I... It's the very rope the hangman used to execute the victims of the judge's hatred. Oh, no. Now, Mrs. Whittem, there's no reason to get upset about this, really. Uh, Doctor, you shouldn't put such horrible thoughts in poor Mr. Lane's mind. He has enough to unseat him already. I, uh, I did it for a definite purpose. Mr. Lane, I want you to fix your attention on that rope. Now, I know you're sound of mind and body, but hard work and long hours and this suggestion of the devil, especially in this lonely old house, can do things to the mind. Now, I don't mean this is any offense, but if you should find yourself having, well, hallucinations or some unexplainable fright, I want you to pull that rope. It'll give us some kind of a warning in the village. We might be able to be of some help. Well, thank you, doctor. I'll do that. <laughs> I may get stuck with a problem. Mm, fine. Goodbye, Mr. Lane, and, uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised if Benchurch hears the alarm bell from the judge's house tonight. I didn't quite share the doctor's views, but just the same, I caught myself staring at the bell rope. The more I stared, the more restless I became, and every now and then my mind would conjure up the vision of some wretched victim dangling from the end of it. But that line of thinking would have me out of my mind in a hurry. Mrs. Whittem had made the place neat and homey. I wandered over to one of the big windows and flung it open. I was surprised to find that a sharp wind had come up, a very cold wind for April. It was more than a sharp wind, really, but it was carrying a stone. Little drops of rain began to pelt me in the face until soon it became a thing of fury. I bolted the shutters and built up the fire with some fresh wood. I was uncomfortable and was only vaguely conscious of the reason. Suddenly I knew. The rats were quiet tonight. It gave me a slight case of the jitters and... I instinctively took a hasty glance at the bell rope. The rope was quite still. I wanted a hot cup of tea, but remembering my promise to Mrs. Widom, I desisted. Instead, I sat at the great oak table and opened my books. Soon I had started a problem, and the noise of the rats began. For the first time since I had taken up residence in the church's house, I was glad to hear those rats. I had worked for an hour or so and suddenly became conscious of the furious storm outside. I was thankful that I didn't have to be out of it. The faint movement of the bell rope compelled me to walk over to it and take it in my hand. I saw nothing. It had only been the wind, and the rope was rising and falling gently with each new gust of air, which caused the bell to sway back and forth a little. That rope had a deadly fascination to it. I wondered why the judge wanted such a grisly memento in his house. The thought of it sent a chill through me. Or was it a thought? Didn't I sense a tremor along that rope? I couldn't be sure, but at that moment I remembered the picture. I walked over to the table, picked up the lamp, and approached the spot where I'd seen the picture the night before. I counted out the pictures until I came to the third one from the fireplace. Even before I raised the lamp, I could see that Mrs. Whittam had washed it clean as I had told her to do. Then what I saw... What I saw gave me such a start that I nearly dropped the lamp. My knees almost gave way beneath me, and I was conscious of huge beads of perspiration that were forming on my forehead... Just looking at it made me tremble like an aspen leaf. The picture seemed fairly to leap out at me. 
for there, dressed in his scarlet and ermine robes with a judge, with his merciless evil face, his sensual mouth, and a nose that was shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. His face had a cadaverous coloring. It was a ghastly picture. But it was the eyes that really made me go cold. For those eyes were... And heaven help me if I'm going mad. Those eyes were the exact duplicate of the evil eyes of the great rat. The picture had been painted in this very room. I began to compare the two, and as my eyes swept the room, they were suddenly riveted to the judge's chair. For there, with a the rope hanging behind it, sat the huge rat with the judge's eyes, and the hatefulness was now intensified with a fiendish leer. Never did the wind howl so. This had to stop. I wanted some tea, but I didn't take any. The doctor had been quite right. The nerves must have been getting drawn pretty taut. Strange, too, because I never was in better health. Well, no tea. We'll substitute some brandy. Let's see now. I had a stiff glass of the brandy and went back to work. The rats were at it again, and I was glad to hear them, for they had become a sort of symbol of normalcy. The storm raised such a fury that I was unaware of anything else. But once, during a sharp, silent lull, I heard another sound, a faint squeaking noise. I listened for it again and soon detected it. It was coming from the corner of the room where the bell rope hung. At first I thought it was just the motion of the rope in the storm, but I looked up and saw something in the dim light that made me all the more positive that I was going mad. For there was the great rat, clinging to the rope and gnawing at it. I could see the lighter coloring where the bare strands were exposed. Just then the rat finished a job and the rope fell to the floor with a thud. For a moment the huge rat just hung there like a tassel. It was then that I realized what had happened. My only contact with the village was now gone. I don't know why, but I rushed to the lamp on the table, snatched off the shade and ran over to the picture of the judge. A chill of horror went through me. But I think I must have expected what I saw. It seemed more like a confirmation than a shock. For there in the center of the picture was a great patch of brown canvas, as clean and as fresh as the day it had been drawn over the frame. And where the portrait of the judge himself had been, there was nothing. I heard a sound behind me. When I turned around, I really got the palsy. I suddenly became incapable of movement. I could hardly think. I had been prepared to see most anything, but what was there? For there in the judge's high back chair, with his black cap in his hand, his ermine robes fixed about him with a smile of triumph, twisting his cruel mouth, was the judge himself. As the clock struck the hour, it seemed to beat the blood right out of my heart. At the twelfth stroke, the judge placed the black cap on his head and walked deliberately over the place where the piece of bell rope lay in a heap on the floor. He picked it up and drew it through his hands as one would a valuable fur pelt. Then he began to knot one end, fashioning it into a noose. He tightened it and tested it with his foot. All this time, he never took his horribly cruel eyes from my face. I began to feel trapped. For some reason, I could barely move. I could only watch as he started to move along the table toward me. And then with a quick move, and he, he threw the noose at me, as if to ensnare me in it. It missed. He raised it again, never once taking those hateful eyes from my face. Once more, the noose came, flying toward me. Once more, with some last ounce of strength, I dodged it. The room seemed flooded with light. The lamp had suddenly flared up high. I looked about the room and was astonished to see the shiny little eyes of the rats as they peered out the cracks and chinks in the wall. I looked up at the bell rope, my lost and last hope of warning the village. And it was covered with the little fellows. Funny thing, but those rats were the only thing that gave me even the slightest sense of comfort. For as the rats clambered along the bell rope, the bell itself began to sway, and I heard a tiny sound, yes, very tiny as the clamper touched the bell itself. It was only a whisper of a sound, but it would grow louder in time. Or would it? At this sound, the judge looked up, and a scowl of terrible anger came to his face. His eyes were like red-hot coals, and he stamped his foot so that the house seemed to shake. The rats kept running up and down the rope as if they were conscious that it was a race against time. Now the judge was approaching me with a noose in his hand. As he came closer, there seemed to be something paralyzing in his presence, and I stood as rigid as a corpse. 
Suddenly, I, I felt the judge's icy fingers against the skin of my throat. He was adjusting the rope about my neck. Then he picked me up and stood me on the high oak chair and put his hand on the swaying end of the bell rope. As he raised his hand, I was conscious of my little rat friends fleeing through the hole in the ceiling. They were my last hope. I stood there on the chair and couldn't move a muscle. Now that my last hope seemed gone, I wanted the judge to hurry and get it over with. Soon he tied the end of the rope just about my neck to the dangling end of the bell rope. Then he jumped down to the floor and looked at me with those eyes that hated me so. The smile of diabolical triumph seemed to wreathe him in horror. I began to wonder about hangings. I wondered how long it would take, whether the doctor in the village could possibly reach me in time, for I knew that I would soon be sounding the alarm bell. I even wondered what kind of a shadow I'd cast on the wall as I dangled from the end of the rope in this grotesque candlelight. But I didn't wonder for long, because suddenly... The judge grabbed the chair on which I was standing when the sudden movement jerked it out from under me. Oh, 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 oh. So runs the tale of The Judge's House. Remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Tonight's program was adapted from the story by Bram Stoker, entitled The Judge's House. Heard in tonight's program were Dick Thorne as Malcolm Lane, Beth Calder as Mrs. Woodham, and Mel Wyman as a doctor. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. This program was written by Bob Olson and produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m. when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. What kind of person does it take to build a civilization from the ground up? Astronaut Nick Burke will have to learn how to be a leader if he wants humanity to survive on a new planet, even if he himself is no longer human. Nick Burke dreams of successfully creating the first sustainable space colony in human history. After a third failed mission on Mars, Nick returns to Earth heartbroken, but during the trip home, he has an epiphany caused by a near-death experience on how to truly accomplish his dream. Nick launches a billionaire-funded startup company that solves the interstellar travel problem, transporting people in a spaceship without any people aboard. After Nick lands on his new, distant planet, he has to combat his greatest trials yet, including raising children and goats while becoming a colony-building survivalist. Fans of Andy Weir's The Martian and Dennis E. Taylor's We Are Legion, We Are Bob will find familiar themes of innovative science fiction ideas with plenty of humor and pop culture. The hard science fiction novel Seed by Matthew G. Dick, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Present Haunted Stories of the Supernatural.
The Family by John Elliott. Adapted for radio by Derek Hodinot. Starring George Cole as Watson. Haunted. Yes, sir? Uh, good morning. Detective Sergeant Forrester? Yes, sir. I'm David Eccleston, Mr. Watson's solicitor. Oh, yes, sir. Come in, will you? Uh, thank you. If you'd care to sit down for a moment, sir. Uh, thank you, but um, I'd like to see my client first, if you don't mind. Where is Mr. Watson? In the bedroom. But um, before you go in, I think you ought to read this. Oh? What is it? A letter, sir, addressed to you. So I see. It hasn't been opened. Oh, I can see that. Sergeant, uh, Mr. Watson wants me to read it now, does he? I think that's his intention, sir. When you've read it, perhaps then we can have a talk. If you're being somewhat mysterious, Sergeant. I didn't mean to be. But perhaps when you've read the letter, sir. Dear Mr. Eccleston... Kindly forgive my presuming on your acquaintance, but I can think of no one else suitable, this being written in confidence. As you know, I'm a reserved sort of man. I don't make friends easily. You'll be surprised at hearing from me. In fact, I hope you remember me, since you must have to look after a lot of cases like mine. Having received full remission for good conduct, I've now been out of prison for some 18 months, and I'm still living in the city, as you can see from the above address. Although I'm a relatively well-educated man, as you know, I have not succeeded in obtaining good, regular employment. Once a thief, always a thief, I suppose. I'm not in trouble again. Let me make that perfectly clear. No. This letter is about something peculiar which has happened to me lately. It concerns a young woman called Carol Temple. I met her one night as I was approaching the front door of the boarding house where I live. <coughs> Who's that? <coughs> Who is it? It's me. Only me. Who is me? And what are you doing here in the porch? Nowhere else to go. Oh, shivering. Were you going to stay here all night? Yes. You live here? I have a room, yes. Oh. <coughs> Do you know what time it is? No. It's gone one o'clock in the morning. I didn't think anyone else would be coming in. That's why I settled down for the night. But you can't sleep out here. I've done it before. What, here? No. Other places. My dear child... Leave me alone. I, I'm not going to hurt you. Don't touch me. Where do you live? <coughs> You're from the country. Run away from home. Maybe. Alone in the city. No friends, no money either, I suppose. Look, you can't stay here. Not with that cough. You'll catch pneumonia. Come on. What are you going to do? There's my room. It's not much, but at least it's warm. And you can have something to eat. What do you say? <laughs> so, you have no home, no parents, no relations. Is that right? Yes. Where are your belongings? Hmm? Your, your things. You must have a suitcase or something. Clothes, personal things. I left them. Where? Behind. Behind? Where? At a station left luggage office, perhaps. In the country? Where? Oh, stop going on at me. You sound like the police. The police. Yes, that's where I should take you if I had any sense. I would if I... Look, Carol, why don't you go to the police? Tell them what you've told me. They'll help you find somewhere to go. 
They have contacts with people, organizations who assist young girls. No. But they'd help you. No, please. Please don't make me go to the police. Why? You, you haven't done anything wrong, have you? No. Is that the truth? Yes. I'd like to stay here. I like it here. We could stay for tonight. Thanks. I'll sleep in here on the floor. You can have my bed. <coughs> <coughs> that cough really is bad. You need a doctor. You need to stay in bed for a few days. Then let me stay. Please, Mr. Watson. Let me stay. I won't be any trouble. I can talk to you. You're nice. You'd like me to stay. I know you would. You'd like a bit of company. Carol, if I... If I thought about you staying... Oh, thank you. No, no, just, just a minute. I said, if I thought about it. I want you to answer my questions honestly and truthfully. What do you want to know? Well, you, you've told me nothing about yourself. You've been evasive in all your replies. Where do you come from? A small village called New Hampton. It's in the West Country. Why did you leave home? Because I hated them and they hated me. Who's them? Your parents? My real father's dead. My mother and the man she lives with, they run a boarding kennels for dogs. I used to help them, but, well, they treated me like muck. No one else would work for them. I was forced to. So I decided to run away. I think they wanted it that way. That way they could be rid of me. <coughs> <coughs> and that's the truth? Yes. I see. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I haven't any suitable night clothes for you. Well, I could find you a shirt to put on if you like. No, I don't want anything. Don't want to put you to any trouble. There's a bathroom off the landing, to the right. You can't miss it. You'd better get to bed. It's through that door. Thank you. And uh, about staying... No, we'll talk about it in the morning, Carol. Good night. Good night. Well, Mr. Eccleston, I want you to believe me when I say that I had no intention of taking advantage of this girl. But during the night... On that cold, hard floor, I not only felt uncomfortable, but I also felt an excitement. I don't mean excited sexually, but an excitement as if in a dream. I'd never had a naked girl in my rooms before. You may not believe it, but I've hardly experienced sex. No. What I felt most of all at that moment was a warm friendliness towards her. And soon I found myself in bed with her. She said nothing. Her body felt more developed and mature than I had expected. And then we made love for the first time in my life. It was wonderful. But afterwards... I'm sorry. Carol. I shouldn't have. Did you hear what I said? I said I was sorry. It doesn't matter. Good morning. Morning. I made you some coffee. Oh, thanks. Thought I smelt it. Uh, have you had anything to eat? Oh, I had some toast. Hope you didn't mind. No, no. Of course not. Mm. Ugh. What's the matter? No sugar. Sorry. Uh, you weren't to know. Well, um, what are you going to do? Look around. I've decided to look around for something. Good. Good. You can stay until you find a job, if you like. No. 
That's very nice of you, but... Well, I got a girlfriend who might put me up for a week or two. I'll phone her this morning. But I thought you didn't know anyone in London. Well, there is this girl. She's not a friend, at least not a close friend. Only met her once. But I got her address and she might help me. I don't think you need to worry about me anymore. Honest. I see. You'd better take this. You can't afford... I'm not broke. I can afford a couple of pounds, for heaven's sake. Are you sure? Yes, you take it. It's the least I can do. Thank you. After she washed up the breakfast things, she went. And I was alone again. There was no legitimate work that spring, though I assure you I tried. I did some more knife work. Well, you know what I mean by that. And over Easter, it was possible to do some daytime work, too, while people were away. Well, this is in the strictest confidence, of course. Because of this, I became a bit depressed. My whole life seemed a bit pointless, especially when I thought about Carol and our one night of intimacy. But I neither saw her or heard of her again. Until one evening... The 13th of April, the very anniversary to the day that you defended me in court. I arrived home late from a job. Hello? Carol. That's me. Are you all right? Can I stay? Of course. Your coffee. I remember to put sugar in it this time. Oh, thanks. Oh, what have you been doing with yourself these last three months? I got a job as a kennel maid at a place in Rickmansworth. Oh, that's nice. I didn't like it much, though. Why? People that ran it weren't friendly. Well, why weren't they friendly? Don't really know. Had you done anything? No. No, in the end, they told me to go. Were they dissatisfied with your work? Don't think so. Well, they must have been if... No. No, it wasn't that. I told them I was pregnant. I see. Are you? Yes. How long? Just under three months. Oh, Carol. Yes? You can stay here as long as you like. I'll arrange it with the landlady. <laughs> hey, hey, no. Don't cry. I, I'm, I'm going to look after you. We're going to be together. You don't have anything to worry about. Please. You're so kind. And you've no reason to be. Nonsense. But, no but. Please, listen. The night you found me in the doorway. Carol, I don't want to... I want to tell you the truth. If I'm to stay, I want you to know the truth about me. All right. When you found me, I hadn't just arrived in London like I said. I'd run away. I'd run away from someone. Someone? Who? Someone. Doesn't matter. A man. What I said about leaving home and coming to London was true. But I was picked up by this man and I went to live with him. And, and then he put me into a house with some other girls and, well, he tried to make me like them. A brothel? He turned you into a prostitute? I told him I wanted to leave. That I wouldn't say anything. But he threatened me. Still, after a few weeks, I managed to get out one night. I was afraid to go to anyone, even the police. I'd never be safe from him, you see. That's when you found me. I was hiding from him. That's the truth. I thought you should know. And... That's why you changed your mind about staying after we made love. You thought the same thing was happening. Yes. 
something like that. Well, it uh, does raise a question about the child, doesn't it? I'm not saying it's yours. No, I know you weren't, Carol. I know that. You've asked me to stay, and I'd like to. But it'd be unfair on you to take on the responsibility of a child if it isn't yours. See what I mean? Carol, can't you see? D don't you realize? I love you. What you've told me doesn't make the slightest difference. I love you. I loved you when I first saw you, and I love you now. I'd hoped beyond hope you'd return, and now... Well, I'm not going to let you out of my life again. And so it was. The next six months were the happiest of my life. We never discussed the baby much, not at first. She was content to do the shopping, look after our little flat, and I got regular daytime work now. She got plumper and she visited the clinic regularly. She made the arrangements with the hospital that when her labor pain started, I was to take her in right away because she was a bit narrow and small and it was her first child. That happened four days ago. You all right? Yes. They won't be long. <gasps> oh. C Carol? Oh. I'm all right. Another pain. It wasn't much. I'll go and ask the nurse. No. It'll be all right. Babies don't get born quickly like that, you know. Sit down, please. They'll give you something for the pain. When I need it, they will. I don't need it yet. All right. I love you. I love you. Mrs. Watson? Yes? Would you come this way, please? Reception? Yes, Mr. Lorimer. Yes, visiting hours are from three to four in the afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, excuse me. Yes? I'm inquiring about Mrs. Watson. She was brought in last night. Last night, you say? That's right. Emergency, was it? No, not exactly. She's having a baby and... I was passing the hospital on my way to work this morning, and I thought I'd call in to see how... There's uh, no record here of a Mrs. Watson being admitted. Do you know the ward she was taken to? Um, no, I forgot to ask. Watson. No person by that name. Do you know the name of the nurse who was on duty? No. Would you just wait a moment? Janet? Madge, reception here. I have a Mr. Watson. He claims he brought his wife in last night. Maternity. Yes. Just checking, Mr. Watson. She's here. I know she is. I, we sat over there, uh, waiting, and the nurse Keep came and... Keep calm, Mr. Watson. Probably a slip-up on the paperwork. It can happen. I'm on to maternity now, and they're checking the night's intake. But she is here. She must be here. Yes. No record of a Mrs. Watson. Impossible. Three intakes last night. Needham, Curry, and Patel. Thank you, Janet. Look, I know this is the hospital. Well, I was going to ask you that, Mr. Watson. Are you sure this was the hospital you came to last night? Well, of course I'm sure. We, we, we sat over there. A nurse called my wife. We said goodbye, and she went down the corridor and into the lift. She must be somewhere. Uh, but perhaps she's been taken to the wrong ward. Highly unlikely. There's no record of her maternity, and there's no record on last night's log, a copy of which is left here. I don't believe it. I must be going mad. You're saying my wife doesn't exist. No, of course not. I, I want to see the head man, please. Something's gone terribly wrong. I mean, who's above you? I have to speak to someone. Mr. Watson, please try and calm down. My wife is missing, disappeared, and you're saying... Oh, my God, I, I'm dreaming this. Please, God, get me someone in authority. Do you hear? Get me someone in authority. Well, 
Mr. Eccleston. They turned that hospital inside out. I called all the other hospitals in the area. They checked. No one could find Carol. I left my name and address. They said they'd notify the police. I dreaded going back to the flat. I'd be all alone again. But of course, I had to go home. As I walked, I found myself trembling. I got the keys out of my pocket. As I put the key into the lock, I thought I heard. I was sure I heard. Carol! Carol? Carol? Are you there? Carol? Carol? <laughs> You're here, aren't you? I know you're here. Carol? Carol, where are you? Mr. Watson? Yes, officer. What is it? Sorry to get you up, sir, but I've been given to understand that you've been inquiring about a Miss Carol Temple. Yes. Yes, uh, come in, officer, please. Thank you, sir. Do you know where she is? Well, sir, yes, in a manner of speaking, I do. What do you mean? You know she's deceased. Deceased? It's all right, sir. Uh, take it easy. I'd sit down if I were you. Uh, thank you. She's dead, you say? On Wednesday, April the 13th last. Oh, well, that's impossible. Well, I can remember it exactly. I've got my notes on it, sir. I'll read them to you, if I may. Between 6 and 7 p.m. at Marble Arch Central Line Station, a young female, identified by the contents of her handbag as Carol Yvonne Temple, threw herself from the westbound platform in front of an incoming train and was killed outright. The young lady was discovered at the post-mortem to be in a state of pregnancy, nearly three months advanced. There were numerous witnesses. Foul play is not suspected. The verdict was suicide while of unbalanced mind. I'm surprised you hadn't heard of it, sir. Oh, what, what did you say, officer? I said... Oh, never mind. All I can say, sir, is that you couldn't have been with a young lady last night at the hospital. You may have been the last person to see her alive on April the 13th. Sir? Sir? Well, that's all. I'd better go. I'll see myself out. Oh, no. Not again. Please. Not again. <laughs> I 
have not been out since. I shut the bedroom door because I can hear the baby crying in there, and I imagine Carol in there with it. I got dressed after the constable left, though I've not yet shaved. I cooked myself some dinner yesterday and managed to eat it. All last night I sat trying to figure it out. It's all very quiet in here now. I, I hope you don't mind if I conclude this for the present, since I can hear the baby crying again, which I have to stop. I have to stop. I have to stop. Well, Mr. Eccleston? Hmm? Is it evidence? No doubt about it, Sergeant. Do you want to see him? He's in the bedroom, you say? Yes, sir. How did he do it? Don't know yet. Waiting for the doctor's report. I see. No, I'll just make a note on the envelope, and you can give it to the coroner. The above unfinished letter was found addressed to me in the dead man's lodgings. That was The Family by John Elliott, starring George Cole as Watson. Carol was played by Janet Moore, The Sergeant by Peter Baldwin, Eccleston by John Church, The Nurse by Elizabeth Ryder, The Receptionist by Jane Thompson, and The Policeman by Graham Faulkner. Haunted is adapted and directed by Derek Hardinot. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour.
in the dark. Midnight, midnight in the metropolis, town of a thousand moods and contrasts, of wealth and lightness and laughter, of poverty, heartbreak and tears, of shadowy people and dark, dark things. Big city, hard-boiled and tender, weak and mean and cheap without dignity, and great and proud and powerful. And the metropolis at midnight, filled with the high spirits of joy seekers, revelers who give way to the goodness of living or try to forget the badness of living. Midnight that is brooding, sinister. The sounds of the big city at midnight the squeaks and roars of taxicabs, the rumble of trucks, the moan of river boats, and underground, the subway, and under and above, the sounds of the people, shrill, ribald, futile. But there is quiet, too, in the teeming city at midnight, the quiet that is broken by the wail of a child, the rattle of a snore, or, as in the home of Earl Breton, a par private detective, and his partner, Owen Bailey, called the professor, the telephone rings, and the professor answers it. Hello? Earl Breton? No, this is Mr. Bailey, Breton's partner. Who's calling? This is Bill Henderson. Is Earl there? Uh, just a moment. It's Bill Henderson, Earl. You want to talk to him? Bill Henderson? What does that crooked politician want? Sounds very anxious. Well, that's too bad. Tell him I'm very busy. I gotta go to sleep. Hello, Mr. Henderson. Yeah? I'm sorry, but Mr. Breton Listen is to not me, in... Bailey. If Earl doesn't talk to me, he may be responsible for my death. I can't possibly see how All that... Right, let me have the phone, Professor. Hello, Henderson. Is you, Earl? Yeah, what's on your mind? I gotta see you right away, Earl. Can you meet me down at your office? Office hours are from 10 to 2, Henderson. You know that. I'll see you tomorrow. No, wait, Earl, wait. I tell you, you gotta see me tonight. Now, look, I, I can't... can't... wait until tomorrow. Because I may never get there tomorrow. How do you figure? I can't explain it on the phone, but I know what I'm talking about. I gotta see you tonight. Gotta. Uh, where are you now? I'm at my house. Okay. Give me a few minutes to get a cup of something warm. I'll meet you down at the office. Ah, oh, thanks a million, Earl. Never mind the thanks. Bring some money with you. Don't worry about that, Earl. This is worth anything to me. Goodbye. What seems to be his trouble, Earl? Well, he's probably swindled one guy too many. Good. What do you mean, good? I mean, he picked a good time for it. We can very well use the money, you know. Well, you can start drawing the bill now, Professor. And remember, after office hours, it's triple the usual. Here comes the elevator now, Earl. If we ever make enough dough, Professor, remind me to move out of this broken-down building. All buildings are pretty much alike at this hour of night. How do they expect one old guy to take care of this whole thing by himself? He manages if you don't rush him. Yeah. yeah what devil has got his finger on it? Oh, it's you, Mr. Britton. Faith, you, you'll never be known as a patient man. I hate waiting for elevators, old-timer. Good evening, Mr. Bailey. Good evening. You've got lots to do around here, haven't you? Sure, sure. I've got to make the rounds, you know. How's business? Oh, very slow, Mr. Britton. You're the only two people I've seen all night. Hey, it's pitch black out here, isn't it? Yeah, you want me to put the hall lights on? Don't bother, old timer. We'll make it. It might help if you throw your flashlight beam down the hall. Oh, sure thing. Yeah. Uh, how's this? That's fine. Here. I've got the key, Earl. Right. Uh, thanks, old timer. We're okay now. Uh, I'll be seeing you on the way down, gentlemen. Now, if I can just find the switch. Uh, oh, uh, here. What's the matter with the light? Looks like the switch don't work. It's working all right when I left this evening. 
Where to find the desk lamp? Find it, Earl? Yeah, yeah. You didn't take the bulb out of this lamp, did you, Professor? Of course not. I've got an idea, Professor, that we have company. You're a very smart chap, Breton. Who's that? Just stay where you are, both of you, and don't ask any questions. Mr. Breton knows that those lights are not out by accident, but if either of you makes a false move, there could be one. What are you looking for? Information. And why keep us in the dark? There's enough light for me from that street lamp shining in your window. I can see you both. What do you want to know? I understand, Breton, that you got some new dope on the Kennedy murder. Am I right? Kennedy murder? Why, the police gave Kennedy up as a suicide five years ago. But would I be... Stay where you are, Breton. I told you, I can see. Yeah, yeah, sure. Seems kind of... Yeah, I guess our visit is a little touchy, Professor. You didn't believe that I could see you. Next time, I won't miss. Now, give it to me, straight. I told you, I don't like the smell of a body that's been buried five years, and I ain't digging it up. Now, what else do you Mr. want? Mr. Breton, are you in there? Don't make a move. Mr. Breton, Mr. Bailey, now, whatever happens, you... <laughs> okay, I hope you get a big kick out of beating up a helpless old guy. That was very tough. Very. Duck, Professor, I've got a... What happened, Earl? Where are you? Right over here where that voice was coming from, and he's not here. Maybe he moved over to another corner of the room. Duck behind something, Professor. I'm going to light a match. <laughs> Careful now, Earl. Well, I'll be... There's nobody here. Who? Who's that lying in the doorway? Wait a minute. Looks like the old timer. Here's his flashlight. I'll turn it on. Yeah, put him in this chair, Earl. No, no, it's too late, Professor. He's dead. Dead? That dirty rat killing a sweet, harmless old man. Mm. Wait, well, what's this here on the floor? Let me see. Hotel it. key. Ah, Hotel Markham, room 517. Think that fell out of the old man's pocket? No, no, that's a mobster's hotel. It's full of gamblers and racket men. Then that means if we go to room 517, we ought to be able to find out the man who did this. You don't find anybody in that hotel. You smoke them out. Besides, that key might have been stolen just so somebody could plant it here. Don't you see that? Then how are we going to know? The voice, Professor. I'll never forget that voice. I'm promising the old man now that I'll find it. Well, what do we do, Oil? You go find Henderson and tell him we won't be able to see him tonight. I'm going to the Hotel Markham. Meet me there as soon as you're through. In front of the hotel. And what about the old man? On our way out, we'll ring the night alarm. That'll bring the police. But aren't we going to tell them what happened? Right now, Professor, we don't know any more than they do. Come on, let's go. Anything I can do? Oh, hello, Breton. How's the hotel business? Oh, we don't complain. Uh-huh. Uh, who's up in room 517? Who want to know? I understand there's a game going on. So? So, I'd like to get in. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Sparrow ran to the room. Maybe you know him. That's all I wanted to hear. You can tell my good friend, Mr. Sparrow, I'm coming right up. Don't worry. I will. Oh. Now, by the way, I hear there's a shortage of keys. You still lose many of them? Certainly we do. Every day. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, look who's here, fellas. My old pal, Earl Breton. How are you, Sparrow? Fine, fine. Come on in. Thanks. How's the game? Pretty good. You want to take a hand? Yeah, maybe. How long have you been playing? Oh, about 12 hours. Now meet the boys. All right, fellas. This is Dan Huber. He's new in this town. Yeah? Didn't take you long to find this place, did it, Dan? Me? I got a nose for this stuff. <laughs> yes. And you know Harry Jackson, Earl, don't you? Sure, I know Harry. How are you, Harry? Fine. What did you say, Harry? I said I'm fine. That's what I said. Uh-huh, sure. Now, this is Willie Garvin, and over oh, here... that's we... a funny name, Willie. What's funny about it? Well, how do you spell it? G-A-R-V-I-N. Why? Does it sound familiar? Uh, no, uh, Willie, no. And I don't have to introduce you to my partner, Joe Murray, huh? Hello, Joe. Hello. Funny to find you and Sparrow in the same game, Joe. What's funny about that? 
Well, after all, you and Sparrow are partners, aren't you? Know what he said for you, Breton, and if you don't like what goes on here, you can shove off. Come Get on, it? Earl. When are you going to stop burning up Joe? <laughs> Anyhow, he just came in a few minutes ago. So we really just started playing together. Oh, just came in a few minutes ago. Where were you, Joe? Since when do I report to you? Well, I'm just curious, that's all. I told you before, Breton, I don't like coppers, and that still goes. Now, let's get the game going. Well, Earl, you taking a hand? Sure, sure, but uh, first I got to get the professor. He's got my dough. I'll be back in a few Wait minutes. a minute, Breton. What are you trying to pull? Why didn't you bring your dough in the first place? I just wanted to see who was in the game. Oh, sure, Joe. He's got a right to know. Go ahead, Earl. Get your dough. Oh, but uh, don't forget to come back, huh? Otherwise, it wouldn't look so good, huh? Sure, don't worry. I'll be back. <laughs> How long have you been waiting, Professor? Uh, I just got here. Did you find out anything? No, oh, not a thing. I listened to every voice up there. Not one of them was the right one. How about you? Did you see Henderson? Yeah, that is, I didn't see him, but I found out about him. What do you mean, found out about him? Well, when I got there, Earl, there were a lot of people outside the house, and the police were there. Police? What happened? Henderson was murdered. It was midnight when the phone rang in the home of Earl Breton, a private detective. A man named Henderson was calling. Henderson, a crooked politician who insisted he was in danger of being killed and that he had to see Breton immediately. Earl agreed to meet him in his office. But when he and his partner, the professor, arrived a few minutes later, they were faced with a peculiar situation. The lights in the office wouldn't work. And before they could investigate, a voice challenged them from the darkness. Their unknown visitor fired at them, purposely missing, in order to warn them that he meant business. The sound of the gun attracted the attention of the night watchman. He came to investigate and was killed by the intruder, who disappeared, leaving Earl with the old man's body and a clue. The key to room 517 at the Hotel Markham. They rang the police alarm and Earl sent the professor to intercept Henderson to break the appointment they had with him. Then he went to the hotel to room 517, where he expected to find the killer. He interrupted a card game, but Sparrow, the gangster who was registered in 517, invited Earl to sit in, much to the displeasure of his partner, Joe Murray. Breton accepted, promising to return soon. He went down to the street where the professor was waiting. The professor had news for him. Henderson had been murdered. How did you find out he was murdered, Professor? I overheard two policemen talking to one another. Did the cops know you were there? Oh, no. We wouldn't want them to know we was interested, would we? Good for you, Professor. But now that I think of it, Earl, shouldn't we tell the police what we know? Well, that's a good idea, except that we don't know anything. They can't find out for themselves. But they don't know that Henderson called us to meet him at the office. And then when we got there, we met somebody else. And it was that somebody else who killed the night watchman. I know there's some connection between those two things, Professor. In fact, if I didn't know Henderson's voice so well... You'd say that it was the man at the office who imitated it? Sure, that's an old trick. A man disguises his voice to sound like... Hey, just a minute, Professor. Why couldn't it be... You mean you actually think that the man we met in the office was the one who called us earlier and he imitated Henderson's voice? No, no, no. That'd be too obvious. The killer's much cleverer than that. But you do think he had something to do with both of the murders? Certainly. If he didn't, how would he know that we were coming down to the office at midnight? He was expecting us. So he must have been with Henderson at the time Henderson called us. If you don't mind my saying so, Earl, it doesn't make sense. Why should this man have bothered to come down to our office just to ask us about some murder case that was over and forgotten five years ago? That's just it, Professor. He didn't want that information at all. That was just to throw us off the track. That was why he left the key there when he slugged the old man and disappeared. You mean he actually wanted us to follow him here to the Hotel Markham? Don't you see? He was trying to establish the alibi that he was playing cards in this hotel at the time of the murder. And he could force us to testify as police witnesses that we saw him here. Then why don't we tell that to the police? Oh, Professor, you're slipping. You know the police don't want ideas. They've got their own. Besides, if we don't know whose voice we heard, what can we tell them? 
Well, at least we can tell them that it was somebody who's up in that hotel room now. Sure, sure, but can we prove it? Uh, I guess not. Well, then what can we do? We gotta go upstairs and find out who that phony voice belongs to. But our life can be very short in a place like this. I mean, I'm not thinking about me. I know, Professor, I know. But I made a promise to that old watchman that I'd find the guy who killed him, and I like to keep a promise. But uh, we ain't got enough money to play cards with those people. They don't know that. Well, I don't think it should take them more than one hand to find out. All right, then you'll have to stall. Now, one of those guys up there has a phony British voice. So? Ah. Uh, Listen. Stay where you are, Breton. I told you, I can see. How's that? If I wasn't looking at you, I'd swear it was the guy in the room. Good, good. That's all I wanted to know. I knew you'd keep your promise to come back, Earl. Oh, why not? This is my night, Sparrow. Well, come on, take a chair. I think I'll let the professor play for me. I do much better when I'm looking over his shoulder. Suit yourself. Let's get going. You're holding up the game. How many chips, Professor? Well, uh, uh, that's up to Earl. Chips? Why, um, uh, what do you say we start off with $10 worth, Professor? I got a hunch. I, um, I guess that's all right. Wait a minute. Who are you kidding, Breton? Since when do you figure you can get in on this game for 10 bucks? That's just a starter, Joe. I always like to play hunches. But you've got more than that, haven't you, Earl? <laughs> you know better than ask me that, Sparrow. Yeah? We'll see. Okay, deal him out. Joe, if I didn't know that you just came into this game a little while ago, I'd figure that you were losing plenty. Why? Ah, oh, you're so touchy. I open. Five bucks. Uh, raise your ten. I'm out. Well, playing it safe, Professor. I'd rather not explain my game. Maybe if Joe played it safer, he wouldn't be so worried all the time. Oh, Joe. Joe's got lots on his mind. I don't know, Sparrow. You're Joe's partner. You never seem to worry like he does. What do you mean, worry? Who says I'm worried? I'm just careful, that's all. I don't trust nobody, see? Nobody? You mean not even Sparrow, your own partner? I said nobody. Oh, Joe thinks maybe I talked too much. That's right. I didn't hear you say anything out of place, Sparrow. <laughs> he thinks I made a mistake telling you he, he just came into the game a little while ago. I uh, told you to shut up, Sparrow. Oh, come on, Joe. You don't have to be afraid of Earl Breton. He's a cop, and I told you don't have to know nothing. He wouldn't repeat anything he heard up here, would you, Earl? I always play it safe. <laughs> I think you're all right, Earl. Ah, uh, mind if I stand up? Where are you going? I just want to walk around a little bit, stretch my legs. Uh, just don't go looking at any hands. Okay. I'll stand over here by the wall. You are gonna let the professor play by himself? Sure. Hey, this is a very interesting electric light switch. You guys don't cut the chatter, I'll blow this game off. Hey, hey wait a minute. Who put those lights out? Put the lights on. What are you getting so crazy about, Joe? You act as if you just murdered someone. Put up the lights, I said quick. I'm sorry, Joe. That was my mistake. I didn't know the light switched off this way. Shut up. And you, Sparrow. What was the idea saying I murdered someone? What are you talking about, Joe? I didn't say anything. Don't give me that stuff. I heard you. You can't fool me with that phony voice you put on. I told you I didn't say anything. Oh, yeah? Well, I happen to know that nobody else but you talks that way. Cut it, you dope. Did you know that wasn't my voice? Sparrow, if you're trying to pull anything... Okay, okay, Joe. Sparrow's right. Now, don't get sore. It was my fault. I didn't know. That ain't the point, Breton. I want to know what he's trying to pull. It ain't none of your business, copper. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry. It was my voice you heard, Joe. What? Why, you? All right, what's the game, Breton? No game, Joe. Just a joke, that's all. Sure, Joe, just a joke. Very funny, too. Can't you take a joke, Joe? Ah, uh, nuts. All right, Breton. If you want to stay in this game, get up some real dough or beat it. Okay, okay, I'll come clean with you. That's all the dough we got with us right now. If you let me go in the next room and make a call, I'll get some sent up here right away. Why, sure, sure. You want to use the phone, huh? Yes, it's right in the next room. Thanks, Sparrow. This is the desk. Hello. Get me Spring 73100. Spring 73100? Right. Who are you kidding? That's police headquarters. Say, have you got any complaints to make? Hold on there. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What goes on here? Is this one of your keys? Oh, hello, Sparrow. I, uh... 
I can't say much for your phone service. No? What's the matter with it? They, uh, they wouldn't get a number for me. I see. Who you're calling is so important. The police. I, uh, I guess I can wait. Yeah. Say, I'm glad you came in here, Breton. I, uh, wanted to have a little talk with you. Alone. You wouldn't use that revolver right here in this room, would you? Wouldn't I? You know, I can do pretty much as I want to in this hotel. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But if you killed me now, wouldn't you have to tell Joe why you did it? Well, what do you mean? I mean, wouldn't you have to tell him that you were tired of being partners with him and Henderson? That you wanted the whole racket for yourself? So that you killed Henderson, trying to make it look as though Joe did it so he could take the rap? <laughs> uh, if you're trying to talk loud so Joe will hear you, I might as well tell you, he just left. Ah. Uh. Well, at least I found out it was you who slugged the night watchman in my building tonight. So what? Just that you killed him, that's all. Mm, you shouldn't have gotten away. Then you're admitting that you killed Henderson and the watchman? Only to you, Breton. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to make sure that you'll never be able to tell it to the cops. See? I don't have to tell them, Sparrow. They know about it already. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you gave them all this information before you came up here. No, I didn't tell them. You did. You know something, Breton? I'm beginning to think you're a little bit nuts. I suppose you wouldn't believe me if I told you the police are listening to you right now? They heard you admit all this to me? Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me you hid them in my closet. No, no. But they're right outside in that room where we were just playing cards. You're crazy. Why don't you take a look? Because I ain't dumb enough to turn my back on you. Then that makes it easy for them to come in. Drop the gun, Sparrow. Give it here. But it is the cops. But we heard the whole thing outside, Breton. Pretty smart. But how did you get the cops up here? I didn't get them, Sparrow. You did. Cut it out, Breton. It's true. You know the best way to bring the police is to leave a hotel key next to a dead man, and that's what you did. Yeah, but you picked it up. Not me. I just made a mental note of it, that's all. What puzzles me, Earl, is how you know the police were out here when you made Sparrow talk. Ah, oh, that was easy. When I tried to put through a call before, I heard a voice at the switchboard asking about a key. And I just played a hunch. Yeah, I'm glad we got here in time. Come along, Sparrow. Well, Professor, let's go home. Yes, sir. Oh, and look, if our phone rings again tonight, don't answer it. shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour.
As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich. And that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them and they said yes, so now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now, the Hermit. have been deeply altered. I have learned the results of the blackness of terror, the hideousness of sin, and the horror of madness. On Wednesday last, about 10 p.m., a telegram was delivered to me. Who on earth can be sending me a wire? Who else but your father? But Papa always calls. Well, before you open it, we're not going to Blue Acres this weekend. We haven't had one weekend to ourselves since we were married. Paul, it is Papa. I knew it. No, you don't understand. Here. Your father's seriously ill. Suggest you come at once. Dr. Lorry. Papa. Papa. Oh, now take it easy, Marlene. He's never been ill a day in his life. Your father's getting along in years, darling. You can't expect him not to have some bad days. But Dr. Lorry says seriously ill. And he's usually terribly conservative. We must start at once. understand me. I love my husband, Paul, very much. But up until the time I married, I had never left my father's side. We'd been inseparable. Ever since that dreadful morning, when as a little girl of eight years, my papa had taken me on his lap, and after kissing me tenderly and brushing the curls back from my forehead, he had said, Little doll, your papa has something very sad to tell you. But you must be very brave, my darling. Your mother has left us. She has written this note to inform us. To Terence and Marlene. Life here at Blue Acres has grown intolerable for me. You're a little child, Marlene. And therefore I cannot explain some things to you. But Terence will know why I'm leaving. My little girl. Try to think kindly of your mother. I would take you with me if I could, but that is impossible just now. Your father is a wealthy man, and he can give you fine things. 
I know at Blue Acres you will grow up to be a lady of whom I shall always be proud. And a daughter whom I will love forever. Do not cry, my little doll. Had your mother loved you, she would never have left you. From this day forward, there will be no mention of her name in this house. To us, she is dead. It was some years later that I learned that my beautiful mother had left Papa and me and had run away with Philip Court, a chap the townspeople said was a worthless dauber in paint. Nothing was ever heard of my mother or him after they left the Acres. Nor did my father, Terence Lane, ever mention her name. He devoted his life to me. I had private tutors that came to Blue Acres to instruct me. The very best. Papa imported a master of the piano to teach me. We remained aloof from the world. The only woman in the household beside myself was Mrs. Eaton. Father always did the cleaning of the house. For Blue Acres is filled with priceless treasures. And when I would laugh at him dusting, he would always remark, Can't let her clumsy fingers touch this vase. It's worth a thousand dollars if it's worth a penny. The years moved on, and I lived in a world of my father's creation. Until this last summer when I was 21 years old. One glorious summer night when the moon made golden patterns on the terraced lawns of Blue Acres. And the waters of the colored fountains centered in the ground shot a million rainbow lights into the night. When the French doors of the music room were opened wide to let the cool night air enter in. I sat at the piano playing the works of one of my favorite composers, Debussy. not fond of Debussy, and as soon as I began playing, he got up from his chair and went to his study. But the haunting melancholy of Debussy suited me. It was a background to my dreaming, and the somehow lonely feeling of my heart that was growing stronger as the years wore on, with only Papa for my companion. I went on playing. Suddenly, I was aware of the presence of another in the room. I felt it strongly even before I turned around. Oh, please go on. It's beautiful. Suited to a night like this. Please. I'm sorry, but I oh, don't Oh, don't believe... be sorry. I'm the one who owes you an apology for my intrusion. I'm Paul Wilde. I'm spending my vacation at the Truesdales who live down the road a ways. Oh, yes. They told me there was a princess living at Blue Acres. But they didn't do you justice, young lady. No princess was ever quite so fair or lovely as you. Please, Mr. Wilde. The Truesdales also added that a dragon named Terence Lane guards the Princess Marlene with his life. That was very unjust. Really? Well, then, if you're not zealously guarded, how about taking a stroll with me? The night is wonderful. And if you're good... I'll reach up and pick you a necklace of stars to wear. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilde. You won't go? It's late. And Papa would object? No. Well, then, with your kind permission, I'll call tomorrow afternoon to gain his consent for a date tomorrow night. Do I have your permission? Well, yes. Fine. Then do something for me now, will you? If I can. Play something for me as I walk away. Shall we have something light and joyous this time? Something more in tune with the happiness in store for you and me. I'll be listening for our theme song. Paul, Paul Wilde. Only those deeply in love can understand what I mean when I say it was adoration on sight. I knew that from that second until eternity, there would be none other for me than Paul. And true to his word, he was at Blue Acres the next afternoon, asking Father's consent for an evening with me. I didn't hear their conversation, but I did hear from Papa later. My dear, I'm an old man. 
wise in the ways of the world. I've spent my entire life protecting you from the vulgar of this world, the worthless. Had I protected your mother more carefully, there never would have been the scandal in this house caused by her treacherous act. But Papa... I have already called into the city. This Paul Wilde is nothing but a simple clerk with poor wages. Is there never to be anyone for me? Of course, when the time comes. But this is not the time. I had never disobeyed my father, but I did so that night. I sent Paul a note, and we met at midnight in the gardens of Breaker. My Marlene. Say it again, Paul. It sounds so wonderful. I've never had anyone but Papa speak my name with love. My Marlene. I have a lifetime of love to give you. A heart bursting with love for you. Do you love me, my darling? Oh, yes, Pa. Say it. I love you. Oh, I love you. And now say this. I love you enough to leave Blue Acres and marry you, Pa. I love you enough to leave. Oh, Pa, I can't. I can't do that to Papa. Must you give up your life to him? No, but to leave him as Mother did. Then will you let me go out of your life? No. No. There were other surreptitious meetings. There were arguments, persuasions, protestations. But in the end, love won out. Paul and I ran away and were married. I will never forget the following day when Paul and I returned to Faith's father. What is done cannot be undone. Papa, you forgive me. Yes, I forgive you. Oh, Papa. Paul, isn't he wonderful? You are the love of my life. And if Paul realizes this, he will not keep you absent from me for any long periods of time. Of course not, Papa. Blue Acres will continue to be our home. But I hadn't reckoned with Paul when I made this statement. He would not quit work and live at Blue Acres off Papa's bounty, as he called it. So for the time being, we'd been spending weekends at Blue Acres. At this moment, I felt a little resentful that Paul had taken me away from Papa. We arrived at Blue Acres, and Mrs. Eaton opened the door to us, just as dawn was breaking over Blue Acres. Oh, at last you've arrived. Come in. Papa, your father's a very sick man. What is it, Mrs. Eaton? I think, Miss Marlene, you should let Dr. Laurie explain. Oh, here. I'll take the luggage upstairs. I'll go to father. You'll find him in his study. Doctor had a bed set up in there where it's easier for me to care for him. Besides, he seems more content there. Hasn't Dr. Laurie gotten a nurse for Papa? We tried it, but he wouldn't have one. We'd better knock on the door. Doctor's in there with him now. Come in. Papa, I ran across the room to my father's bed. I looked down at him, and then in dismay at Dr. Lorry. For my father's face was a horrible sight, twisted and pulled out of shape. And his eyes, his burning eyes, they were staring at me wildly. I reached out for his hand and cried out to him, Papa! I... I... What is it, Dr. Lorry? Stroke. I... Oh, Papa, don't worry. Dr. Lorry will get you well again. Can you hear my voice? I'm not quite sure this morning, but I think so. He does know who you are. Uh, come outside with me, Marlene. I want to talk to you. I'm going in the drawing room, Papa, to talk to Dr. Lorry. I'll be right back, and then I won't leave. I won't leave until you're well again. Come in the drawing room, Doctor. I should never have left him. Fiddlesticks. You did the right thing. But my marriage has brought this on. He loved me so, and I love him. He's been lost with me, gone. Marlene, I, uh... Dr. Lorry, his eyes... Yes, my dear. I was just about to talk to you of this. What is it? I wish I knew. Your father is suffering from some terrible fear that I'm inclined to think is nothing to do with his fear of dying. Has he said anything about it? He can't speak. Only the guttural sound you heard. 
He can't write. He can't lift his hands. Oh, dreadful. What that fear is, I don't know. I've watched with him nights, and it appears that whatever causes his wild fear is worse then. Poor Papa. As soon as office hours are over this evening, I'll drive out here to Blue Acres. Perhaps between the two of us, we'll be able to discover what causes his distress and be able to help him. It filled my heart with sorrow to see my father suffering such pain and discomfort. And the look in his eyes, the mad, wild look, was almost more than I could bear. At last night came. I rejoiced when I heard Mrs. Eaton usher Dr. Laurie in. He and I sat by Father's bed while the heavy minutes ticked past. There seemed to be no change in his condition. But as night wore on and it was fast reaching midnight, there was a change in his eyes. The fear in them was so marked that I trembled from it. Dr. Laurie said... Do you see? His eyes. Yes. It's as if he sees something we don't see. Yes. It was so. His eyes seemed to be riveted on the door to his study. And it was then that I thought I heard a low moan. What was that? No. It didn't come from Father. No. But look at him now. Now Father's eyes were trained in closer to his bed. <laughs> he was struggling, attempting to lift his hand. <laughs> it was very plain to me, and I cried out. <laughs> Doctor, there's some unseen thing standing over Papa's bed. That is the way I diagnose it. There is. Something unseen to us, but clearly seen by your father. <laughs> and look... The bedclothes are moving, but he's not touching them. What is it? Dr. Lorry, what is it? <laughs> An unseen spirit, eh? Witnessed only by the dying. What does Lawrence Terrence Lane see, eh? What causes him to fear so mightily? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and now the hermit will continue. <laughs> Only a few minutes have passed. But Marlene... Her anxiety to aid her father in his terrible fear only makes matters more difficult. Now it appears that the dying man wishes his beloved daughter out of the room, too. <laughs> and so Paul, the husband of Marlene, with his arms about her, leads her from the room, guides her into the music room where she sinks into a chair, sobbing softly. Listen. <laughs> Darling, if you get overwrought, ill, you won't be able to help your father. Oh, Paul, it's so dreadful. I tell you, Papa sees things there in his room. Some vision that frightened him. I saw the bedclothes move and Papa wasn't touching them. Please, dear, try to control your nerves. Shall I have Mrs. Eaton make you some tea? It'll help soothe you. I'll be right back, darling. Only take a second. into the kitchen. I sat trying to get a hold of myself. It was only a few minutes after he'd left the room. Once again, I was aware of the same sound I had heard in Father's room. The sound that had made his eyes turn mad with the terror of it. Was I, too, losing my mind? What was the answer to this strange phenomenon? A sound that to my ears was exactly like that of a woman moaning. At first it was close to me in the music room. And then it grew fainter. But still distinct. 
And though it's difficult to believe there was a second when I felt as if something had brushed past my chair, had touched my shoulder, I cried out for Paul. Paul! Paul! What is it? I'm right here. Paul, listen. Do you hear a strange sound? What sort of a sound? A sound like a woman moaning. No. I heard it distinctly. You listen. Hey, you drink this tea and forget about such things. Please, Paul, quiet. Now, do you hear? By George. You do hear it? Some unusual sound. Where is it coming from? I don't know. There it is again. Yeah. So it seems to be coming from these walls of the music room. That's it. Or from out on the terrace. Oh, it's nearer than that. Here, in this wall behind the piano. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Why are you feeling the walls? This panel here. Look. It... Why, it's the panel that opens. I've lived here all my life, and I never knew of it before. And in a room in here. And you can hear the moaning from here much closer. Marlene, get the candle from the piano. I'm going to look around in here. Yes. Here, Paul. Yeah, this passage in here must lead to another room in the house. I'm coming with you. And the moaning we heard was from someone in the adjoining room from here. Paul, wait. Here, look. What is it? This enormous chair. Listen. Quick, there's someone inside this chair. I believe you're right. Hurry, they'll smother to death. <sighs> Now it's locked. Locked? Someone's been pushed into this chest, and it's been locked against them. Hurry, can't you break it open? I'm going to try. Now the lock is giving now. skeleton, Paul. Two. Two. I'm going to take this chest into Terence Lane's room. When I question him and show him what we've found in his secret hiding place, no doubt we'll have the answer to our tragedy and our riddle. When confronted with the chest and the skeletons of human beings found in it, when asked questions by Dr. Lorry that Papa could answer by a nod of his head, we found the solution to the mystery of Blue Acre. Yes, the skeletons were those of Philip Court and my mother. My father had killed them before they ever got away from the house the night mother intended to leave him. Dr. Lorry filled in many blank spaces in the life of my mother and father. Your father was an insanely jealous man, Marlene. He would allow her no friends. He even went to the city alone and bought her gowns for her. He would allow no one to look upon her. He hated me because I attended her at your birth. Oh. I was surprised when he allowed you to get away from him and marry Paul. But I've figured that out now. What do you mean, Doctor? I found a large quantity of arsenic in his desk. Great heaven. I'm sure it was his intention to do away with you, Paul. Then, once again, he could have Marlene to himself. Take me away, Paul. next morning. Terence Lane, my father, is still living. Mrs. Eaton cares for him. I haven't been out since that horrible night when the moaning of my mother's spirit led me to her grave. But we will go out this weekend if he's still living. Paul says I can never be happy unless I forgive him. Besides, the eyes of my father show madness in the evening after darkness gathers. And so we know he is tortured enough. Each night he must see the spirit of my mother standing over his bed, accusing him of his crime of double murder. Unable to speak to those who stand beside him. 
And in the night time, a vision of a woman appears before him. The vision of one whom he murdered because of his insane jealousy. Yes. Terence Lane has learned during these last hours the blackness, the awful blackness of terror. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Places and occurrences mentioned in the hermit's cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio